Okay, just wanted to let everyone know we're live streaming now. Chair, when you're ready. Thank you, Sergeant Arms. We're ready. Uh, oh, I just want to make sure you're good before we start our recordings. Um, Sergeants, we're going to start with the recordings. Recording to the computer, all set. Recording to the cloud, all set. John, you may begin with your opening now. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on Small Business. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification. Once again, all panelists, please turn on your video for verification. To minimize disruption upon testimony, please elect, place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Joe and I, we're ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant Arms. Good morning. I am Council Member Mark Jonai, Chair of the Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our hearing today on the Mayor's Recovery Agenda. The COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected certain boroughs and neighborhoods, highlighting health and economic disparity in our city. From total COVID-19 infections and mortalities to small business closures and unemployment numbers, lower income communities and communities of color have experienced the worst of this pandemic and its economic devastation. Unfortunately, New York City's minuscule relief efforts intended to helping struggling New Yorkers have also failed to help the highest need communities. During the first round of Paycheck Protection Program, for example, New York State received one of the lowest amounts of PPP funding in proportion to its total eligible payroll. The city's relief program also failed to equitably disperse needed financial relief to struggling small businesses. As the previous SBS commissioner acknowledged at a small business committee hearing last year, SBS's employee retention grant program and small business continuity loan fund predominantly benefited businesses in Manhattan. SBS report on the breakdown of the loan and grant issued by the city council district, zip code and industry type further revealed failures of those relief programs. Businesses in council district 11 qualified for more total grant money than businesses in any other Bronx Council District, but CD11 still received the 37th lowest amount of grant money. When discussing the creation of the Employee Retention Grant Program, Mayor de Blasio described the purpose of the program was to benefit our smallest small businesses with under five employees, a lot of mom and pop neighborhood based stores. However, Attorneys, offices, physicians, and dentists were the three professional groups that received the most amount of money through the program. The Small Business Continuity Loan Fund also failed to disperse loans to seven council districts, five of which are in the Bronx. I understand that these programs were created under short notice and the former commissioner and SBS employees worked tirelessly to launch them. Nonetheless, for the city to recover, the outer boroughs must cover, and the outer boroughs were not given a fighting chance to recover under SBS's previous relief efforts. We all recognize New York City's engine is, New York's, is Manhattan, but the outer boroughs are the fuel that operate that engine. I was glad to see the mayor and the commissioner announce in late November the creation of three new programs to benefit small businesses in low to moderate income communities. The LMI storefront loan, interest rate reduction grant, and the strategic impact COVID-19 commercial district support grant are steps towards reviving the economies of outer borough communities. I want to thank the commissioner and his staff for all their hard work in launching these programs. 
Unfortunately, we have seen reports of a number of issues related to these programs. Zip code 10013, which includes parts of Chinatown, was excluded from the LMI storefront loan program because SBS used the Department of Housing and Urban Development's 2020 median income for the New York City region to determine which zip codes qualify as low and moderate income. This data set overlooks certain lower income neighborhoods in the city that are part of the same zip codes as neighborhoods with more affluent residents, which exclude certain businesses from applying to these programs. To qualify for the LMI storefront loan business program, also required to provide a personal guarantee on the loan, which actually contradicts recent protections passed by the council that protect business owners from personal guaranteeing rent to property owners, a double standard. As a small business in the, in the city of New York, experiencing decreased revenues without a clear idea of when the city will resume its normal economic activity, requiring all applicants to agree to a personal guarantee made the press applicants to the program. As the purpose of the loan program is to benefit businesses in low income neighborhoods, the possibility of low income business owners losing their personal assets may cause further harm in certain communities in the future. So I look forward to the commissioner's testimony today and his explanations on some of the issues I just outlined, as well as explanations on the insufficient and inadequate dollar amounts offered to COVID-19 rescue loan and grant programs, more equitable distribution of the limited funds, and what this administration will be doing in the future to assist our struggling small businesses, which built this city and without which would not survive. With that said, I wanna thank my chief of staff, Reggie Johnson, legislative aide, Austin Sackler, our, legis our senior legislative counsel, Christopher Sartori, our policy analyst, Noah Meixler, and financial analyst Aliyah Ali for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. I want to turn it back to the committee council. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Joni. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Counsel to the Committee on Small Business, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. At this hearing, we'll be hearing testimony from the Department of Small Business Services, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom hand raise function and I'll call on you in order. We'll be li limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. For remaining panelists, we'll be limiting your time to three minutes to accommodate all who have come to testify today. Also for all panelists, when called on to testify, please state your name and the, and the organization you represent, if any. Uh, we will now be calling on representatives of the administration to testify. We will first be hearing testimony from Janelle Doris, Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services. You will be joined by Deputy Commissioner Jackie Mallon, who will be present to answer any questions. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to Commissioner Doris and Deputy Commissioner Mallon, and I will call on you individually uh, for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth for these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Doris? I do. Deputy Commissioner Mallon? I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Commissioner Doris to present his testimony. Uh, before we begin, sorry, Commissioner, we I would just like to acknowledge the different uh, council members who have come to who are present so far, it's council members Powers, Rosenthal, Koo, Perkins, and Lander. Thank you. Commissioner Doris, you may begin. 
Good morning, Chair Joe and I and members of the Committee on Small Business. I'm John Aldoris, the Commissioner of New York City Department of Small Business Services. I'm joined by SBS First Deputy Commissioner uh, Jackie Mallon. We are grateful for the opportunity uh, to testify today on SBS support services to small businesses and job seekers under the continued impact of the COVID pandemic. Uh, 11 months after New York City's first confirmed COVID case, New York City's small businesses are still reeling. The impact continues to be devastating to our small businesses and especially to our immigrant and minority owned businesses. At SBS, we have worked tirelessly to provide a backstop uh, for businesses and blunt the most severe damage from this health and economic crisis. Agency-wide, we have delivered over 108,000 services to businesses across the city. A small business recovery hotline fielded over 52,000 individual calls, and we have hosted 275 webinars and nearly 50,000 individual participants. We've walked in over 70 commercial corridor tours, meeting businesses uh, where they are, and we've connected with over 100 business advocacy groups to support outreach. We've launched four grant programs and two loan programs dispersing vital direct aid to businesses. We recently launched three new mentorship programs for businesses in the hardest hit communities, MWBEs and a new initiative for black entrepreneurs. SBS launched the Shop Your City uh, campaign, a multi-phased uh, uh, advertising and social media campaign uh, to encourage uh, consumers to shop locally. This campaign, which includes resources to help uh, consumers find local businesses, will continue indefinitely. With employment still a challenge, our workforce team has assisted more than 69,800 individuals, referred over 36,300 people to jobs, and worked with over 980 businesses on over 25,000 job opportunities. And we have connected more than 8,600 New Yorkers to jobs with an average wage of $17.44. We've launched a career discovery uh, NYC to provide online no cost training that prepared New Yorkers to pursue an in-demand career. A primary goal over these 11 months has been to confront the stark inequality and pa the pandemic has exasperated in our communities. After the first round of stimulus uh, under the CARES Act, we all saw large portions of the community did not have the same access to aid. Analysis of the first round of PPP showed that businesses uh, led by people of color in New York were less likely to receive a loan, and when they did, were more likely to receive less funding. We knew that we had to design programs that reached these small businesses, and we had to do it creatively and with limited resources. A mixture of grants and loans in a, it is an ideal way of getting funding in fast and also leverages the limited dollars that are available. The New York City LMI storefront, the interest rate reduction grant and strategic impact COVID-19 commercial district support grant were designed as a two grant, one loan, three part program to target those that did not get their fair share. We know that immigrant and minority communities uh, businesses are all too often shut out of traditional credit markets. CDFIs have historically played and continue to play a vital role in filling this gap. With the interest rate reduction grant, we worked with CDFI partners to target these borrowers directly with a grant to pay off the interest and reduce debt for those clients. To date, the interest rate reduction uh, grant has removed interest costs for over 290 small businesses across the city. 88% of these grants have gone to minority owned businesses and LMI communities. Our continued work with CDFIs has also de deepened and opened new opportunities for collaboration and partnership. Additionally, our CBOs are vital and trusted community partners. They provide unparalleled cultural competent outreach, build trust and bring resources to the communities that need it the most. The second grant, the Strategic Impact COVID-19 Commercial District Support Grant was designed to bolster these community support systems. We've simplified the application process and reduced programmatic red tape to maximize impact. We also announced the awardees of our Strategic Impact COVID-19 Commercial District Support Grant. We've awarded uh, over 750,000 to 24 organizations across the city. They will use these resources to conduct outreach and provide technical assistance and support for small businesses in the targeted LMI communities. The LMI storefront uh, loan was designed to directly target reports that showed LMI communities received disproportionate federal funding. 
This program expands our reach to leverage in private dollars to provide 35 million zero interest loans to these hardest hit areas. Our LMI storefront program has worked diligently to reach potential borrowers and support them in determining if a loan is right solution for their business. To date, we have approved uh, over 5.5 million to the businesses and over 80% of these are minority owned small businesses. The path forward for many of our small businesses is through federal aid. The latest round of stimulus funding can be a real lifeline to our city small businesses, but we must make sure they get their fair share. We launched the Fair Share Campaign NYC to help businesses take full advantage of this opportunity. For many of our businesses, this funding will be the difference between surviving through the pandemic and closing their doors for good. Fair Share NYC leverages what we learned in the first round and provides information, one-on-one -on -one support and direct connections to lenders when needed to ensure businesses are not left out. With over 284 billion on the table, we can't afford to miss this opportunity. To get the word out on the program, we've launched a webpage, created daily webinars, created uh, flyers in 15 languages, and have shared content with over 100 business organizations, bid CBOs, and community partners citywide. We create the train the trainer content that any interested party, advocacy group, or individual can follow and become an outreach ambassador for small businesses. Businesses will learn about PPP forgiveness loans and economic injury disaster uh, loan advan advance, known as IDLE, th that gives grants to uh, grants of, I'm sorry, 10,000 to micro businesses and businesses in low income communities. Then we provide direct one on one support to businesses to understand what product is best suited for them. We then get to work on details and help them review and put together their loan documents, calculate loan repayment terms, uh, connect them with our network of 40 lenders, including CDFIs, bank, credit unions, nonprofit lenders, small business administration. And we help prepare SBA loan forgiveness documents and help, uh, help them understand loan payment and deferment options. With these services in up to 15 languages, we are much better positioned to support businesses through this round of funding. With the new administration in Washington, we are also hopeful that we will not be uh, the last, this will not be the last opportunity uh, for our small businesses. We continue to advocate for more aid to our hardest hit businesses, direct liquidity to our CDFIs, more funding for deeper outreach and rule changes that help ensure that no business is in need is left behind. SBS will also remain dynamic and adaptive uh, to the needs of small businesses, we will continue to be innovative and bring more programs like Career Discovery NYC, mentorship programs, BNYC, WeNYC, Fair Share NYC, the Open Restaurants, Open Storefronts program uh, to owe our businesses. And if and when additional funding becomes available, we will build on what we have learned and continue to find new ways to directly support our small businesses in a way that fast and easy and equitable. Thank you for your partnership through this crisis, and I look forward to your continued support and feedback as we get to the other side of this pandemic, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, your commitment and passion is recognized and known to me personally, and the importance of these hearings is not only so that we educate New Yorkers, but we also get an opportunity to hear from them on their struggles uh, and their issues and collectively we address them. Uh, you and I have spoken so many times since uh, the start of COVID and the impact that it's had on our small businesses and New Yorkers from loss of life to devastation of our economy. Um, we have the same commitments to help and stabilize New York. Commissioner, so that it's easier for us to follow. There were six programs, four grants and two loan, pro two loan programs that were offered by the city. Is that correct? Correct. Can we go through them one more time, please? The two loan programs, what are they and what was the total dollar amount allocated? So the one loan program was the Business Continuity Loan uh, Fund, which we did earlier on uh, last year. And out of that, that program was about, we had uh, 20 awards, 404 approvals totaling about 23 million. 
The other loan program was the uh, recently announced uh, LMI storefront loan program, which is a $35 million zero interest loan program. Thank you. And the four grant programs? The New York uh, NYC Employee Retention Grant Program, that is uh, 3,400 businesses approved, about 25 million there. Uh, we have the three programs, uh, the two program grant programs we discussed here, which is the interest rate reduction grant program. Um, and the uh, community COVID uh, community grant program we talked about for C, uh, CBOs, for uh, community-based organizations. What, what was the dollar amount for the interest rate reduction grant? Uh, that one we have uh, allocated so far to that program about $1.5 million. And for the strategic impact COVID-19 commercial district support grant? That grant is originally allocated uh, 700,000. We've awarded about 750,000 and there's slated to be another phase uh, of that program for additional funding um, uh, we will be announcing shortly. I think we're missing one of the grants, the employee retention, the interest rate, the strategic uh, impact. What's the other grant that we're missing? I believe that's all, all the programs that we should be, maybe there was a typo there, but they're, they're, that, that's all the programs we have. Those, those are the five programs. Right. Three grant programs, two loan programs. Correct. Oh, you may be, you may be referring- Oh, I'm sorry, to I'm sorry. I, 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 we didn't mention it in the test, that's why, I'm sorry. The emergency, uh, our small business emergency grant program for businesses that were looted. And so that program uh, is about 1.3 uh, million or so. Yeah. In total, right? Yeah. I just want to make sure that I get my Yeah, number. yeah, I'm sorry that we didn't mention that in there. Sorry about that. Yeah. So 23 million, correct? 35 million. 25 million. 1.5 million. Seven hundred and fifty thousand. And 1.3 million. Am I correct on all those numbers? Correct. Roughly $86,550,000. What is the acceptable um, number of small businesses that we recognize exist in New York City? Uh, we uh, we normally go by 200 about 240,000 small businesses that are in the city with employees. That number varies between 230 and 270, so 240 is right in the middle somewhere. I'm grateful to you, Commissioner. You and I agree that this is the in our lifetime. This is, COVID-19 has been the most devastating. Uh, factor in small business, let alone the loss of lives and all the other devastation. I don't think, I don't know of in my lifetime, any other impact so devastating. You agree? Oh, absolutely. And the question is, do you think the programs you just outlined and the dollar amounts were sufficient to meet the challenges that our small businesses could not possibly prepare for nor was it in their control. Uh, Mr. Chair, you know how I feel about this question. Uh, this is a very uh, important question, one that we grapple with and making sure that um, from our perspective here at SBS, uh, we know that the need is great. We know that the need is greater than uh, the resources that uh, the city has and what we have and um, in part why we on top of what you see here, um, we have also connected our small businesses um, to additional funding and support, be it the federal government, philanthropic, others that are not listed here, but certainly uh, we do hear you on that concern. You agree that the uh, amount of funds that were allocated are not sufficient, that we provided we had a magic wand, I'm sure 
uh, you would have uh, desired to do much, much more for our struggling small businesses? Yes, yeah, certainly we are and will take ad any additional uh, resources that we can get to help small businesses, absolutely. With that being said, obviously we, we know that this wasn't enough and certainly much, much more is needed. Do you feel the limited funds that were provided that $86 million and 550,000 was dispersed equitably throughout the city of New York? Um, I believe uh, you know some of the lessons that we've learned from the earlier investments that were made uh, in uh, small businesses. And by the way, we were the first city, uh, the first state uh, in the state or in the country really um, to do anything for small businesses. I just wanna say that um, before the federal government acted, the state acted, any other state in the union acted, New York City acted and we acted and released the small business uh, retention grant and the, uh, the loan fund, the continuity loan fund. So certainly uh, we were ahead of the curve there and certainly with the fact of a $9 billion deficit, which I believe our council uh, members also concerned uh, there with the, with the deficit that we were facing, uh, the city did come up with a program and initiated that program and got those funding out the door to small businesses. Certainly. Uh, we've learned uh, for a lot from that exercise. We've learned a lot from how the federal resources came uh, to bear in the city as well. And we have developed our new programs that we mentioned here, particularly uh, when we talked about the emergency uh, grant uh, for businesses that were looted and businesses that went through uh, significant turmoil um, during the times of protest, et cetera. Uh, how those that, that program was designed, how the three uh, design programs, the LMI programs, they're all in response to making sure that we are moving in the right direction when it comes to how we uh, administer the funds. And so, um, you know, I will go and go back to say the the uh, earlier program uh, was 50% uh, either a minority and or women uh, program, and certainly. Uh, the other programs are, are the like. Matter of fact, we just said today uh, on the three LMI programs, we're over 80% uh, minority uh, and LMI, low, very low income communities. So I believe we are moving in the right direction and, and distributing these funds uh, appropriately. I think we're learning from the lessons uh, of the past and we're administering the funds the best we can uh, in this climate. Thank you for that answer, Commissioner. Uh but it's a pretty straightforward question. Do you feel that the money, the limited money was distributed equally and equitably where needed most? Um, I, it's a yes or a no. I know that you gave me- I'm a not whole... sure if it's a yes or a no. I mean, I think, I think we're, we're showing progression. Okay. And I think uh, we believe that, you know, in some instances we do uh, see that. I think we're seeing, um, uh, ways that the new programs, we absolutely believe uh, that we have seen tremendous amount of movement in that direction. Um, and we will continue to sharpen ev at every turn, at every time we get. And I think that's, the, that's what government does. That's what we have to do. We, we have to change, we have to adapt, and we have to make changes. And, but certainly, um, you know, majority of uh, businesses receiving fund are low income, majority are um, women and minority groups. Uh, the majority are in LMI districts right now. So I, I believe that, yes, we can do more there, but certainly that is, that's, those are the facts. So commissioner, based on that statement, then I would be, what you're saying is the grant program, one of the grant programs where the three recipients of the highest dollar amounts, the professions and industries were physicians dentists and lawyers. Do you think that they are the groups that needed the most help during this devastation? Well, you're, you're talking about the earlier programs, correct? I, I'm referring to all, I've wrapped them up into one ball of wax. $86 million for 240,000 businesses. I'm looking at this across the board and it's numbers, math, math matters here. There are seven, there are six programs, Four grant programs, two loan programs, 
the total amount we discussed, the number of business we discussed, and to find out that even in the earlier program, the three professions, the three industries that received the most amount of money were lawyers, physicians, and dentists. But I didn't even get into the geography of where they're located. So uh, I'm not sure, okay, from the report here, we have um, for the Small Business Continuity Loan Fund, about 15% went to restaurants and bars, 13% to professional services. I'm assuming that's uh, along the lines of what you're mentioning around those particular professional services. In the existing program, LMI Storefront Program, um, we have the majority of those industries are retail and restaurants. Um, so I maybe you're mentioning on the uh, uh, the business continuity loan fund data that I'm looking at here that we submitted to the council. Uh, the professional scientific and technical services, architects, gra graphic designs, and I believe lawyers will fall into professional services as well. That's around 13 percent, and um, Accommodation and food is about 15, uh, okay. 15 Commissioner, I'm referring, to, I'm referring to Appendix C, um, New York City's SBS COVID-19 Employee Retention Grant. The three, employee retention grant. three top recipients are lawyers, physicians, and dentists. Oh, the grant program. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, Which... I, I was I thought you were referencing the loan data. Okay, yeah, which is the largest or the largest grant that we've offered. The employee retention grant was twenty five million dollars. It's the largest grant program that was offered by the city of New York. Thank you, thank you for the clarification of that. That's the program you're looking at. Okay, sure, yes. So we do have, um, yes, that is that is correct. I believe. Making sure I got the. So that's not a WMBE, women or minority owned business. That is not the restaurant industry. That is not the nail salons or nightclubs um, that qualified the most for this much needed financial assistance. Correct? Well, I mean, if it's... Uh... And I, I, I don't believe we uh, have all the in, that particular details break down who's minority or not. I'm saying in that grant program uh, and the uh, loan program, we did see that the majority uh, of that went to that first uh, program was to uh, women and minority. And that's that is that is uh, what we saw in that particular program. So, I'm looking. I, I don't have the breakdown. So if you have a different breakdown on the grant program on the employee retention grant program that is that identifies those three industries, I'd like to see that graph. I don't see those numbers anywhere that the lawyers, the physicians, and the dentists, which are the largest recipients of that fund, are women or minority owned. For those particular professional services, yeah, we will have to figure out and look at that. Uh, closely. I'm speaking of the broader overarching, uh, you know, that encompasses the, all of the grants that were put into that program. Yes. I, so but that, yes, if you want to go deeper into that particular section, we will have to look into that and get back. And the, I'm and guess, thank yeah. you for that, Commissioner. But I'm going to guess that uh, they, the minor, minority owned and women owned uh, companies were not the major recipients of those funds for those three specific industries, which now begins the question of, okay, if we know that the dollar amount wasn't adequate, we know that the industries that needed the most aid that were in dire straits, which I think we could all agree are not lawyers, doctors, and dentists. We're thinking of mom and pop shops. We're thinking of local restaurants, grocery stores. We're thinking of nail salons where that money should have really gone, did not go, did not get there. If we look at that breakdown of the $86 million, total $86 million, how much of that was broken down by, or the recipients of that funding went to Manhattan-owned businesses versus the out-of-boroughs? Okay. 
So <clears throat> we can, uh, I mean, that's, you're, you're asking six programs. I mean, I don't think we've uh, done that analysis. We certainly can go through uh, the programs um, one by one. We haven't combined and put them all together um, like you were mentioning. However, uh, if, with the loan and uh, grant program, happy to talk to you about those. Um, so one second, I'm sorry. We're just getting all, all, those, all that data for you. Um, we'll, we'll pull it up. So uh, for the loan and grant program, um, first the first one that we put out, um, we have the borrow breakdown of those programs. Just the continuity, you're talking about the loan program, the continuity or the LMI? I'm gonna talk about the, the two pro, the continuity loan program and the, and the uh, retention LMI. grant. That's the first one. Okay. Okay, yep. so th those two. So for the, for the grant program, 3% uh, Bronx, 24% Brooklyn, 54% Manhattan. I'm sorry, uh, please, um, one more time, please, Commissioner. 3% Bronx. 24% Brooklyn, 54% mm -hmm. Manhattan. 17% Queens, 3% Staten Island. For the loan program, that earlier program, again, these are the first programs the city put out um, in the middle of the pandemic when nobody in the country had anything happening. 2% uh, two percent Bronx, so one second, one second. Uh, 1%. No, no, two, no, it was not 1%, it was 2 2% Bronx, 21% Brooklyn, 60% Manhattan, 12% 12, 12 Queens, 4% Staten Island. Okay, yes. And, um, that and, and correct. Thank you. Sorry about that. This was confirmed. That leaves the LMI loan program. Do you have a breakdown for that one? The current LMI loan program, uh, sure. So we want to we want to caution that this program is early on. We just started uh, to do awards, but from what we currently have, uh, the breakdown. What is the what is what is the total that you've awarded thus far of the thirty five million? We've awarded about 5.5 .5 million thus far. So we're, we're awarding businesses every day. So that number goes up by the minute. But so far, as of this hearing, uh, we've awarded to about 57 uh, businesses and a total of $5.5 .5 million to date. Um, the, the breakdown uh, for that program is 11% Bronx so far to date, 26% Kings, 26% um, Manhattan, 37% Queens. That's the breakdown. As Staten of Island? Staten Island, we have no uh, awards yet for Staten Island, but we do have applications in the hopper again. This is very early on. We're going to reward at least 350 of these loans, at least. I mean, we're barely past 50. So, you know, this is very early on. So we want to just um, be mindful of that reality as well. Um, on the other programs, uh, the grant, uh, the, uh, the LMI. No, we did the LMI. So now it's the grant. You have the I'm interest get, rate reduction. Yes. Yeah. They're all. Okay. Yes. So that particular program. Uh, we'll pull that up for you as well. <clears throat> Interest rate reduction grant program, borough breakdown. The Bronx, 37%. Brooklyn, 19%. Manhattan, 26%. Queens, 19%. And we, and we don't have any 
uh, grants yet to Staten Island uh, as the CDFIs are working to get that those paperwork in. So that's what we have so far. Again, all very early on. And the strategic the impact COVID-19 commercial, this would give those numbers? Uh, yes, we do. And just flag in for this particular grant, you know, it went to community-based organizations based upon um, what we communities that needed the most and also uh, that were high COVID impact and where we did not have significant SBS, uh, either Avenue NYC or, in, or other grants uh, in there. So in the Bronx, we have, and um, uh, sorry, we don't have, it's not breaking down the same way as the others, but we, you know, I, I'll just list it for you. So there were, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 uh, communities. These are, tw the, uh, these are $20,000 grants to community-based organization to do support business services. And Brooklyn, one, two. What was the 12 though, for which borough? Bronx. Bronx. Again, I, I would not. I would not look at these as in the same light. You remember resources that we've already deployed to uh, these areas. Uh, we're trying to fill some gaps and just support some of these smaller things. So the Brooklyn, the Bronx Chamber, for instance, have fought for community uh, communities that they're going to work with that they applied for, uh, etc. So Brooklyn. So that's nine. Uh, 12, sorry, and nine, uh, nine, I believe in Brooklyn. Same dollar amounts, 20,000 grants? All 20,000 grants. These are all $20,000 grants for community organizations to work with LMI communities where there were not um, a lot of uh, assistance. And so they would have to apply and then um, we will award it to them and they will go ahead and continue doing the work they're doing. The communities, um, in Manhattan and LMI communities, we're talking East Harlem, um, uh, Lower East Side, et cetera. So I won, I believe it was eight there. Queens have uh, three awarded so far. Uh, the neighborhoods, um, uh, again, we, we, are, we did not get some, uh, some applications from some neighborhoods. And so we have, we started up in the second phase to get the, uh, the various communities that did not get a, uh, an award because no one applied. And so we have put it back out again, starting, I believe the applications go out on Monday in which we're going to try to get additional um, community-based organizations to apply for those $20,000 loans. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry grants. grants. Yeah, sorry, Commissioner, because I understood that you originally um, that program was 700,000 and then you bumped it up to 750. Correct. The numbers that you just gave me, 12 for Bronx, three for Queens, eight for Manhattan, nine for Brooklyn, are 32 businesses at 20,000 each, that's 640,000. There is a... Uh, let me make sure. I'm sorry, it's not businesses. These are community-based. Community-based, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one, two. I'm twelve for the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Nine. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Eight Manhattan, three Queens, none for Staten Island. There's a citywide grant to help these organizations with their back office support. So that was $100,000. Uh, and okay. Who's, which entity received that? That grant was uh, distributed to um, the neighborhood a housing uh, organization that is going to help us to do that. It's uh, ANHD. ANHD. Where are they located? Um, I think they have offices around the city. So 
It's an $86,000 grant. Jackie, do you know where they're located? Their primary office? I believe they're, they're located, they are you know, across, across the city. Jackie's muted. Where's their uh, headquarters? Sorry, I, I think it's downtown Manhattan, but I'm not 100% sure to be honest. Okay, but I know they have, you know, they, they serve the whole city, so. Yes. Maybe we'll have the staff look it up in the meantime to see how many offices they have throughout the city, how many are in the different boroughs. Because I'm, I'm painting a picture here. And I think you all see where I'm headed with this. So that would be your 740. Uh, that leaves on the table 10,000 more, which isn't enough to uh, fund any organization. Okay. And that leaves one more program that we haven't discussed, the emergency grant program of 1.3 million, the breakdown by borough. Well, we uh, this program, um, we leave over 65% or so went in the Bronx. I mean, we went where there was, uh, yeah. the, the loot in was and where there was, you know, challenges for those small businesses. And but we have um, those primarily, have primarily those where it went to the Bronx, because that's, as you know, we had some real challenges there. Um, yeah. You know, so it all went there or do you have those numbers? All 1.3 million? Uh, we can get that for you um, just today, like right now. So I, I don't have it uh, in front of me because didn't think we were going to talk about that grant, but uh, we can get that for you as we speak. So that's not a problem. That we will get that for you now. But I only have one other question, and thank you for that whole breakdown, right? Um, I'm looking at Appendix A. Um, and it shows the breakdown by council district, which business received a loan from the city of New York employee retention program. And the top three, which would be council district four, three and one, which cover the upper east side battery park and Chelsea areas, receive, it looks like five, 11, uh, over $12 million those three council districts. The bottom three of that program, which would be council district 14, 12 and 16, which cover Fordham Road, Kingsbridge, Morris Heights, Wakefield, Olinville, Claremont, receive what it looks like here, 30, um, about $70,000 in total. The hardest hit neighborhoods, the poorest neighborhoods, real mom and pop shops, no Fortune 500 companies there. Very few doctors, dentists, lawyers. Council District 16 received a total of $11,833.39. Before I make my question, these are the facts, the numbers, unless you want to dispute them, Commissioner, for. No, I'm not going to, no, I don't, I, I do not want to dispute. Okay, them. great. So then let's look at the data based on receiving grant loans from New York City Employee Retention Program. The three top council districts are four, three, and one, which cover. Upper East Side, Chelsea, and Battery Park, roughly four, 10, 11 million dollars. The bottom three, which are 12, 21, and 16, which cover Co-op City, Elmshurst, Jackson Heights, Claremont, Grand Concourse, receive less than a hundred thousand dollars including the lowest council district 16, which covers Claremont, Concourse, Concourse Village, Kingsbridge, Morris Heights, Mount Eden, and Marsania, received a grand total of $3,000. Remember the question I asked earlier? Was the funding distributed equitably? 
And the answer was, we're trying, we, we made headway, we're balancing the scales. Commissioner, whether it be industry or the outer boroughs, which are much more significantly poorer than Manhattan, the money was not distributed fairly or equitably. $3,000 versus four million, four point three million. The two differences on the opposite scales. Council District 4 received 4.274 million. Council District 16, $3,000. If that's not a red flag, I don't know what is. That's on the retention uh, grant money. And on the um, continuity fund, Council District 4, same council district that received the, uh, the most from the retention employee program, received $5,432,819. Council District 16 received a total of $11,833.39. Does that sound equitable to you, Commissioner? Well, uh, th thanks for the question. I, you know, one, um, I think what we submitted, and I just want to be mindful because I'm not sure we did that analysis that you're mentioning, but um, but certainly, uh, I, I think I think the bigger question uh, and continuing question for us, um, you know, I think. You, you have it earlier on in the program when, this, again, we, I want to say for everybody listening, I think this is important to note again, and I'll keep saying it. Uh, this was the first program in the country, you know, and the first program that was that released by SBS uh, to help quickly do something while we waited for mm -hmm. the federal government and others um, to really uh, do something. And so the city took a step forward and really pushed out a program um, at rapid pace. Within weeks, uh, the money was already sucked up because um, you know, it, it, the need was so great earlier on in the crisis once the shutdown started. So I wanted to contextualize it. The second portion is uh, certainly, uh, I think you know, as we look at um, all the programs we have instituted since these first two programs were, in, were put out, I mean, you know, there were very clear distinctions as to how we want to approach this. And, and once the data came in and we understood what was happening, the reports were out, we reviewed where the resources were going. Um, you had businesses who were uh, better equipped, uh, quite frankly, to go after these types of resources. You had uh, communities uh, who, uh, you know, for this for this type of work, uh, you know, this type of effort uh, was not maybe a, as heavy as a lift. I think initially, when you put out something, those who can respond to the, the quickest, they came and they responded. We addressed that. We addressed that uh, even in the emergency grant and looking at, you know, different communities across the city who were impacted by looting and impacted by uh, a, a lot of what was going on uh, and unrest around the city. Um, and but we focused in and narrowed our program to a point where 70 uh, we're 52 percent um, of the uh, loans that we uh, awarded were in the Bronx and and uh, and then uh, of course in lower Manhattan where we had some uh, challenges as well and, and the list goes on I mean every time uh, we put out a program the LMI storefront program is helping LMI communities uh, across the city addressing exactly the point you're raising. So, um, sir, I, I, I respect that, but I, I, am, I just want to make that clarification to everybody about, uh, about that as well. So I hear you on those points and the analysis, but I also want to say, and, and, you know, whatever we've put out and whatever we've done outside of the first ever in the country assistance for small businesses, um, we have addressed a lot of those concerns you're, you're mentioning. Commissioner, thank you. And this is about clarity. And that was a long roundabout answer to a question that was very simple. Based on the graphs, the charts, the facts, I asked, is this equitable distribution? And 
numbers matter, percentages matter. So when you say, yes, emergency grant program, we gave 72% to the borough of the Bronx, you forget to indicate that that was only $1.3 million. I said 52, and, and no, I hear you on that, sir. And again, we, I, I, I'm also trying to clarify for everyone, um, and I hear you on that, there's, there's no one saying that it was perfect. Um, if it was perfect, we would have changed the way that we went about approaching uh, funding. Um, we said that it was an emergency help. We released the program. Uh, at that time, we, we saw as the, they were coming in, right? The requirements were coming in and the, the applications were coming in. Those who are more able, those who were able to do it up front, were getting it in fast. And so, um, what we're all we're saying is is that we saw that, and uh, there was certainly correction on every other program that we have instituted since that time. And um, in a way to make sure that uh, we give opportunities for those who are hit the hardest. I, I, one perfect example is on the the loan fund that we currently have, our LMI loan fund, we staggered uh, the rollout. Uh, so very, very low income communities, primarily uh, zip codes uh, in the Bronx and other parts of the city, very, very low, uh, were able to have a, a, a head start uh, about a week or two uh, to, to, to actually get in uh, more, uh, get their paperwork together in the system and that before we open it up to the uh, second phase, which included other LMI communities across the city. Uh, and so certainly saw that as a lesson learned, uh, certainly saw that as a change in which we implemented and, and, and in respect the, the concern there, but also the fact that it's, it, it has been addressed and certainly in our programs uh, now, um, we, that's how we are um, uh, you know, administering the resources that we have. Commissioner, it's a longer answer to a very simple question that the answer should be no. The money was not distributed equitably. That was the second question. The first question is this money enough? The answer should have been no. It seems a straightforward question, but I'm going to get to my third question. I, get, I guess we could we say the right thing, but generally don't do the right thing. Does New York City consider itself to be a partner to our small businesses? Do we value our small businesses? Well, sir, I think um, the city has an entire agency dedicated to small businesses. Uh, I would say absolutely yes, we do value our small businesses. They're the backbone of our economy, backbone of our city, the uniqueness that brings character to all of uh, our neighborhoods. Um, and so I believe we do value uh, very much so our small businesses. Thank you for that. And I, and I believe you mean it when you say that. But saying it and showing our small businesses are two different things. Of the $86,550,000 in the six programs, I wanna focus on the breakdown. On the LMI program, of $35 million, can you tell me how much New York City, New York City taxpayer dollars went into that program? The program um, has $31 million from our private sector and another $4 million given to the city uh, through uh, stimulus dollars and actually another 9 million because we're buying down the interest um, to zero for the, the borrowers. So there's an interest rate reduction grant program also looped into that program and also the uh, loan, what we would call the loan loss reserve. So if any of these um, uh, particular businesses, uh, God forbid default or have an issue in paying um, there is a backstop there, and that, those are the funds that the city provided. These hearings are important for transparency and clarity. You stated the total ML, LMI storefront loan program was $35 million. Is that correct? The fund that will be, yes, that's a $35 million fund. And $31 million of that money came from from private capital, 
4 million came from the EDC budget. So if I ask the question again, how much of the $35 million came from New York City taxpayer dollar corporate? What's the answer? Four million? I would I would say that that's the, the dollars the city received and the dollars that the city purposed. So I, I'm not sure how, you, I don't know how you call it. We all taxpayers, we all pay federal taxes. So I'm not sure what- but I'm doing your city's contribution. That down. But the city, the city got- for- the city received those dollars and they allocated those dollars to this program. So there's $4 million uh, on that, on the, 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 uh, the interest rate reduction piece as well, because we're buying it down to zero. There's additional dollars there, but for the purposes of the fund itself, how funds work, yes, it's $4 million. So the answer is New York City taxpayer dollars, not what came in from the federal government, what came in from the state government. We understand that's part of the budget, but the overall question is, what was the dollar amount that New York City contributed into that loan fund? This is important to me and all those that are participating in this hearing. Yeah, I, I, I see where you're going. I don't agree with your assessment, but there's $4 million that the city put into the fund. And I'll just leave it at that. There's $4 Thank million you, the city put into the fund. Thank you for that honest answer. Now, I'm gonna ask another question. On the, the continuity fund program of $23 million, how much did the city put in? That fund was also uh, through our federal stimulus federal. funding the city received. Okay. So federal funding provided the funds for that program, not city taxpayer dollars. I would say yes. The the stimulus fund that we received, we, mm-hmm. we allocated it accordingly. Right. right. So federal stimulus money was applied to that loan program. So city contribution, direct city contribution is zero. I do not agree with that assessment. Uh, We could have done anything in the city with these dollars. We chose to invest it in small businesses. So I would say that's the same. It was given for that specific use from the federal government for the city to do so. But the cost to taxpayers in New York City, those that pay income tax, real estate taxes, water and sewer, that pay sales tax, To the city of New York, of that money, zero dollars came from the city taxpayers' coffers. The answer is yes, Commissioner. That's the truth. And then I'm asked the same, I'm going to ask the same, well, Commissioner, if the federal government gave a stimulus to COVID for New York City, that is not New York City taxpayer dollars. That was the stimulus program that we keep referring to, that the government, federal government's not doing enough, that we need more. So we received some funding, and that funding, the city distributed through programs. I ask the question again, because there's a difference between city tax dollars, state tax dollars, and federal tax dollars and how they're spent. And we had this whole conversation about how New York City values small businesses. They are our backbone, they're our partners. We went through the whole thing about saying the right thing and doing the right thing. That's the direction I'm headed in. And I'm going to And the answer to that, if we peel it all down, the layers, New York City taxpayers contributed zero from our coffers for that program. Would you be surprised that none of those city funds either went to the retention grant program, which was also funded federally. So none of the initial funding came from the city of New York with the exception of $4 million through the LMI storefront loan program. If we use the number that is acceptable of $4 million, And if I'm wrong, please tell me. 
divide that by the number of small businesses in New York City, which is 240,000, equals $16.66 per small business. In the time of devastation, economic destruction, Closing down businesses, forcing small businesses to fend for themselves. In the 1970s, this administration and every elected official has used the words of when New York City needed the federal government the most, they told New York City to go to hell. New York City our partner to small businesses that could not possibly survive without the small businesses that make New York City such a vibrant place, told our small businesses not go to hell, but drop dead, you don't matter, by contributing $4 million. Not only that, but they turned the city, this administration, turned around and says, not only don't you matter and that you can drop dead, but don't forget to pay your real estate taxes, your water and sewer fees, because if you don't, we'll come after you. This is the bleakest day in my life while in politics to have to reveal that New York City does not give a damn about small businesses. And all of these men and women that are partaking in this hearing, that are gonna plead, share their stories and tears as they explain what they've gone through and continue to go through is a tragedy for our city. An $89 billion budget and New York City gave $4 million to 240,000 businesses, which was not even equitably distributed. This is criminal, Commissioner. It's an embarrassment. I am ashamed to be a part of a government that could not do the right thing for New Yorkers in their most dire time of need. If there's any response that contradicts these facts, Commissioner, please correct me. I'm not perfect, but I do know how to do math. And I didn't question my math because I used a calculator. Where am I wrong? Well, all I have to say, sir, is that, uh, you know, look, I, you know, we had SBS, um, uh, we leverage uh, the private sector, yes. I think that's smart. We leverage federal dollars, I think that's also smart. Um, we do all that we can. We've already uh, helped over 5,000 businesses connect to over $125 million in support. Um, that is our work. We are facing the biggest budget deficit since the 1970s, as you know, $9 billion. So I would say uh, that we know we needed to do more. Um, we understand from our analysis, uh, when we looked at the federal PPP program, we understood about $18 billion plus dollars came to businesses in the city. We uh, helped facilitate that through our programs and we help facilitate that through the work of SPS. And so I will stand by our work here of helping businesses connect wherever the funding is. Um, and certainly with the city at where it is budget wise and as a, um, as a, uh, a council member and a chair, you know where we are on the budget side um, and where those deficits are. Um, as a commissioner, I'm gonna go wherever I can find the resources. And certainly we are doing that for our small businesses. We've got a 40 lenders we work with. 
We've got a program with, we just launched with 11 CDFIs where we're helping them to survive because we know they also lend to small businesses. So there is a multiplier effect. We are doing all we can to make sure uh, that we're getting to these businesses. So, um, you know, I, while I appreciate and I definitely understand, uh, I think uh, more than most, uh, I live this every day and certainly going out, I'm not in an office stuck uh, behind a desk. I'm in the field. I'm speaking to small businesses, as you know, uh, regularly, uh, over 30 something in the height of the pandemic, uh, walking the corridors, um, you know, every, every time I had to speak with hundreds of small businesses, uh, if not thousands by now, um, our team has done in the field. And uh, so we know what they're going through. We've seen the, the, the devastation. So I, I hear you on, on your concern there. I, I'm just going to speak to uh, the fact that when a business comes to us and, and they ask for support, uh, we give them support um, and we will continue to do that. Commissioner, the numbers speak for themselves, they're real. Unless you can show me that I'm wrong on my math and the way I have broken down the total dollar amount, it cost New York City, when it came out of New York City taxpayer pockets, the total of $4 million. New York City, this administration spends more than that a year on copy paper and pens and pencils. That's how much we've done for New York City businesses. Unless you can show me I'm wrong. That's the number and that's today's. I, 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 again, I disagree with your assessment and the way that you're looking at that. I think no government will say to say to to anyone that um, if we can't leverage resources outside of uh, the government itself, that's in a $9 billion budget deficit. Like it's, I think it's a reasonable assessment to believe that we will go everywhere wherever the money is to help small businesses. And so we've helped again, over 5,000 businesses. I wanna make this clear for the record uh, of $125 million. And that is what we've done. And we, you know, we will continue, we also, the 18 plus billion dollars that came to the city through PPP was because of the work we have done with 100 uh, community partners, our 76 uh, bids, our five chambers, and the list goes on. That work is because of the intentionality of what we're doing here. It's 18 billion. So you, we're talking multiplier effect. And, and when we're in a, in a deficit situation, I appreciate the analysis. I don't agree with the assessment and or the, the premise of it. I think there's important for us uh, to go where the resources are right now in the middle of a pandemic where there's very, very scarcity. And I'm not saying that it is enough. Clearly it's not, not enough. We still believe that the city needs to get additional resources uh, in from the federal government. And we say that because that's the only place that has money right now. And so we uh, will keep pl plugging away for that uh, to make sure that New York City gets its fair share. That's why we launched that campaign. And again, I mean, I hear you and I certainly appreciate the concern there. Um, and we will continue, as I've always said, and uh, when, when a business comes to us and when we go to a small business, we never come empty handed. We come with resources. We help them connect to resources and we link them to those resources. Um, and, and it's been proven uh, uh, throughout this pandemic, 108,000 services to small businesses. Uh, look, we're not there yet. Uh, we're still not out of the woods yet, but certainly uh, this, this agency is working tirelessly to help those small businesses and help as many of them survive this, this uh, tragic pandemic. And I'm not attacking the agency because the agency does not have the checkbook. Uh, I'm referring to the city of New York and this administration and the dollar amount that it committed to helping small businesses. And when we use words like partners, our partners, uh, the banks that lend the money that actually have to have personal guarantees from our small businesses and we still call them partners and we put those numbers into, well, look what we've done for the city of New York. It's all smoke and mirrors. It would be like me taking credit for the healthcare worker that risked her life, that saved lives because they're in my district and me saying my partner at Jacoby Hospital. We are not partners. New York City has never treated small businesses fairly. I assure you the $4 million that it actually cost New York City taxpayer dollars was generated through fees and fines that were issued to the very same small businesses. This is a tragedy. This is a sad day for me. 
I wish this was not the truth. I wish that you could contradict and correct me because my math is wrong. The numbers are real. The facts are the facts. And it is a sad awakening for the city of New York. I apologize for sounding so aggressive, but when I was made aware of these numbers, I lost sleep. And those business owners that have been losing sleep for the last year, that were hoping that the city can be their life raft, that could give them back what is rightfully theirs, security, aid, funding. We've told them you don't matter. And if you're a business outside of Manhattan, you don't even exist is what we've told them. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to uh, my colleagues um, for questions. I'm not sure who has questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Joni. Uh, at this point, we'll move on to council member questions. I'll now call on the council members to ask their questions in the order that they have used the Zoom hand raise functions. Uh, council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom ha raise hand function, please raise it now. Council members also, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Uh, at this point, we will hear from uh, Council Member Ku who has questions and he, he will be followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Thank Thank you, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Chair John I, for the uh, very important discussion about small business. So, Commissioner, how are you? Uh, I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah, so as a, as a Commissioner of Small Business Service, uh, I believe you're the chief advocate for small business, right? I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, I have heard this economic recovery talk, right? I didn't see, hear anything about eco economic recovery agendas besides some figures, no? So my point is that city administration has to listen to the people when they set out certain policies, right? Yeah, they cannot vehemently uh, 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 impose some policy uh, in New York City, especially the like Queens area. Uh, my district, as you know, is a very important transit hub, very important downtown area. We have hundreds of small businesses that depends on people from around the area, not just the people taking the bus. So recently, the city imposed a, 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 a ban on cars coming into downtown fashion. Only bus and trucks can travel on Main Street for like seven, eight blocks area, which is the, the most important area of fashion, right? So the economy is already bad because of the pandemic. Now you put on this ban, tra uh, travel uh, car ban, People from around the area in the Bayside, Waystone, or the Tri-State area, they cannot come to downtown fashion to do shopping. And we have Lunar New Year next month on the 12th. Lunar New Year is the most busy season for Asian families. They come to fashion to buy all this you know, special stuff to celebrate for the new year. So now business is campaigning. Their business decreased 30, 40%. And meanwhile, the city insists on carry on this plan. Why you have to do this? The local business have to go to court to stop it, but the judge didn't listen to the, to the small business because they don't know how to do a good presentation of the, of, of the argument. So I hope as the chief advocate for small business, you can go talk to the Department of Transportation or the, the mayor, right? Tell them, hey, now is not a good time to do this. No, wait till, let me, four months later, after the pandemic, after everybody go to work, maybe you can try. We cannot lose businesses for the shade of saving a couple of minutes of uh, bus time. They insist on, oh, 
if they ban on this, the bus can travel maybe two minutes faster. Two minutes faster has millions of sacrifices in downtown flushing. That's one point, right? So I hope you will go talk to them because I now believe you're the chief advocate. Uh, I don't want you just to be a talker. You have to do something, right? The second thing is that like, I have talked to you before. Downtown Flushing has so many illegal street vendors. I talked to you four months ago. I talked to you, uh, I forgot the mayor, four months ago. And the worst thing is, he says, NYPD is not taking care of this. So if NYPD is not taking care of this, who is taking care of this? Consumer Affairs is not taking care of this. Nobody come to enforce this law. Last Friday, we have a suite with NYPD and sanitation, and they only do something to the, to the guys who sell fish and, or sausage, those obvious bakers. The policemen go tell the vendors, hey, you're not supposed to do business here. This is a sidewalk. You're, it's illegal. Nobody listen to the police. They laugh at them because the mayor openly said NYPD is not taking care of this. So you have to tell the mayor. I told the mayor already, if NYPD is not taking care of this, someone has to take care of it. There cannot be lawlessness on streets. People now, they take advantage of the situation. Everyone come out to sell on the streets. The, street, the sidewalk is so crowded, you cannot even walk. The sidewalks are for pedestrians. This is not like 1930s, no? Everybody sell on the streets. Now, New York City is one of the most biggest city in the world, and we're supposed to have law and order. So those are simple things, and government cannot do it. So I hope you can answer that. Yeah. Uh, uh, council member, thank thank you for 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 that. I certainly will look into the the street closure issue. Um, um, I wasn't aware of that particular issue. Um, as you know, I was in uh, Flushing um, not too long ago in Small Business Saturday and um, walked up and down and also uh, met and spoke with a lot of businesses there and heard the concern around uh, the vending challenge. I think the last time we spoke, um, we did talk about that. We did convey that to, uh, uh, to our colleagues at City Hall. Um, and also, um, but nothing has changed the, since uh, uh, we talked last time. Yeah, it's even getting worse. It's getting worse. Okay, uh, we'll circle back. I know our team. Uh, some of our team members were with you out there on the vendor sweep as well. The walk that you recently did with the other agencies, uh, and so we did get a. I did get a readout from our team um, on on those efforts. So certainly. Uh, happy to circle back with you and, uh, and come back out and, and see what additional resource we can give. But certainly I know that um, our colleagues at DCWP, um, they are working uh, diligently to, to resolve some of those matters as, as you know. So um, I, I've written it down here and I will we'll be uh, and happy. And the busway. Yeah, yeah I, I will, I'll circle back with you. Yeah, okay. please do something. Otherwise you just all talk and no actions, no? Yeah. You know, people lost confidence in the city. I mean, mm -hmm. why do we have to pay so much tax? Like uh, John and I already said, well, we pay the most burden of taxes and, and we hire people and with benefits and pay holidays, all this stuff, but the city doesn't do anything. And also another thing is the homeless people oh, and the mental health problems. They, those are real things the city has to take care of before we go back to normal. People, otherwise, people are afraid to go sh to shopping. You know, they are afraid to take the survey and being pushed onto the platform, right? Or they walk on the street and being shot you, sh shoot you in the back. Oh, was so many crazy people. The administration has do this quality of life issues to bring back confidence. Quality of life issues are very important. But so far, the city hasn't done too much or not much <laughs> at all. So I hope you'll relay those messages to Mayor, even though he has only like 11 months to go, but if he wants to build a legacy, he has to do something for our small business owners. Thank you, or, or the citizens. Thank you, thank you, Council Member. Thank you. 
Thank you. Councilmember Koo, we'll now hear questions from Councilmember Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Commissioner, good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, Councilmember. Great, great. Really appreciate all your work in the most difficult of times uh, that we've experienced in our life in our lifetimes. So thank you for that. Um, I want to just sort of clarify for the record a couple of things. So um, districts, uh, city council districts one, three, and four were brought up as getting you know a lot of the loan in, and and um, grant funding. Do you, do you think it's possible that the employees of those firms work in uh, the Bronx, Queens, Staten Island, Brooklyn? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think that's part of um, uh, the analysis there. When you think it through, we didn't do a full uh, employee analysis, but we do know that folks who work in the city, um, such as myself who live in Queens, but work in the city, um, right. there, there is traffic that, that comes from the outer boroughs, correct? Yeah, for my small businesses as well. I mean, yeah. One of the reasons I support my small businesses on the Upper West Side is because they employ people who live in the Bronx, who live in the Queens uh, and Brooklyn. And then um, just another quick question. Do you think that there could be some, some overlap, some sort of, do you think it's possible that the doctors, the lawyers and the dentists, they too are small businesses in our local communities who could be people of color and women. Is that, is that something on your radar? Yes, sure. I mean, you know, um, a perfect example is that we've worked with um, the organization SOMOS, as you know, um, when we launched our emergency grant and they were um, the first to step up. Uh, but that's a consortium, as you know, of doctors um, and, and, and healthcare professionals um, and the like who uh, are, are people of color uh, primarily and, um, and do have their, uh, their offices all across the city, uh, our doctors who are, are supportive. So there's certainly, we believe, a significant uh, portion. Again, we, we haven't done that sort of in-depth analysis there, but we, we can, and we do believe that uh, we have a good representation of minority businesses um, in those uh, professional services. Um, uh, yeah, I know a lot of the small businesses in my district are doctor's offices and dentist's offices. And I can imagine that every uh, community um, wants to have um, people who look like them or you know, have the same languages as they be their doctor in their own community. I just, just want to note that's a valued small business. Um, and then lastly, I just want to put it on your radar for upcoming uh, grants specifically, not so much loans, if you could be mindful of the worker cooperatives, um, sort of the alternative non-traditional small businesses, um, which are throughout the district, not, you know, primarily in Manhattan at all, um, but who uh, whose employees are among the lowest income employees uh, and, and people of color. Um, one of the things that our worker cooperative initiative partners have been able to do is access the federal uh, PPP. Um, between all those partners, I think they were able to access over um, $10 million in federal emergency funds, um, as well as nearly 400,000 in private grants and donations um, to help keep these worker cooperatives alive. And, you know, I'm just sort of hoping that in your next round of, of as you continue with your loan program, I'm, I'm hoping you'll be uh, open to the non-traditional um, businesses. Well, uh, council member, you know, this is something very dear to us here. Um, and of course, to our deputy mayor uh, Thompson who oversees um, SPS and 
um, you know, from the employee ownership NYC program we recently launched, um, you know, 70% of those uh, worker cooperatives, uh, those are businesses, sorry, who are going out, um, expired. don't don't have um, a, uh, a, a succession plan, right? And uh, we are saying, hey, come over, we want to talk to you a little bit about what it means to sell your business to your employees, right? Which majority, 85% of them or so, are people of color and women. And so you're absolutely right about what, how, you know, our commitment um, to uh, worker cooperatives and certainly here at SBS, we manage the program that the council has instituted um, and has been really successful. So as part of the fair, um, the fair share campaign, um, we're, we're not focusing on, you know, just uh, one type of small businesses. Uh, worker cooperatives also part of that. So we absolutely agree with you on uh, strengthening the opportunities there uh, for worker cooperatives. And we're committed to that. Um, and certainly uh, would love to talk to you more about how we can deepen that work, um, but certainly um, we're, we're absolutely committed to that. Oh, it's so great to hear. Yeah, I'm really excited about the ESOP program. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Thank you so much for, you know, I think the administration is really on the right track with that. Um, but, but just to sort of, um, just to make sure that that we're all clear. So for worker cooperatives, which are more fragile, uh, oftentimes small businesses, um, they're, they're what they really need access to are loans. Um, uh, sorry, are not the loans, but the grants. Um, so they can continue employing, um, you know, sure. people who need it most and who are doing God's work, you know, home health aides, um, our, our many of our cleaning workers, but also, as you know, uh, dog walkers. Um, and one of the small businesses yeah. that's being used by the city um, during this time. All yeah, right. no, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and absolutely, uh, that is logged and we will um, continue to follow up on the grants component. I think working with our CDFIs who also work with our worker cooperatives, uh, particularly around some of the um, debt reduction programs and grants that I mentioned earlier, um, we certainly are going to uh, deepen our, our um, conversation there. And, and, and also I can get back to you on, on a little bit of what we're doing in that space as well. Great, 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 great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you Chair. Thank you. Uh... Council Member Rosenthal, and I just want to piggyback on this because I just I want to make sure that we understand that New York City as a whole is suffering. All small businesses are suffering, but I don't think anyone will agree that of all of the industries, doctors, lawyers, and dentists needed the help the most during the COVID-19 devastation. And Anyone that has a business in council district four, three, and one, God bless my council members, my colleagues for the districts they represent, to think that anyone from the Upper East Side that has a business in the Upper East Side, Carnegie Hall, Yorkville, Central Park South, Middletown East, Times Square, would be living in the Bronx as a whole majority or the poorest section like council district 16, that received $3,000 as a whole compared to 4.274 million in council district 14 would not be an argument I want to make. Claremont, Concourse, Concourse Village, Highbridge, Morris Park, Mount Eden and Marsania are the poorest in our city and received a total of $3,000 compared to the most wealthiest and affluent neighborhoods in Manhattan. I wanna make that clear. I am arguing and passionate and fighting for all small business, but I wanna make sure that the limited help that we have goes to those that need it the most. And it's not lawyers and doctors that have offices on Carnegie Hill or Times Square. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Council Member Rodriguez who has questions and he'll be followed by Council Member Levin. Thanks, Dodge, now. Thank you, Chair. 
As everyone know, like when I approach anything, question, concern from the small business, I always come from the perspective of understanding that no major has done more to the small business than Major de Blasio. And I feel that, you know, it's tough to be the mayor. We don't have to agree on everything, but it's more easy just to focus only on the negative things than comparing what were the city before and after his administration. So it, with that in mind and that understanding, I do have, as we want know, as a city, we have inherited something what the chairman has said, lack of fair share to all communities. Uh, and with that, uh, Commissioner, uh, can we agree that, that when we look at, at who benefit from those loans in Manhattan, if you do the breakdown, the number of loans that people being able to abstain to get in the Northern Manhattan, Washington Heights, Community Board 12, is also similar to the number in the Bronx. And that when we look at Manhattan, that number reflect the whole borough but most loans were given to not necessarily the underserved communities? If you're, refer you're referring to the earlier program, uh, the uh, fund, the, the, that, that's an earlier loan program that we did the first one? Yes. Um, the breakdown, yeah, I mean, as the, the breakdown we had, um, we, I don't think I don't think we sort of went to uh, down to the community level like that. I, th I did say that there was a about 24, I'm sorry, 54 percent and 43 um, percent uh, grant and loan respectively for for Manhattan. Um, we did get uh, the most applications from Manhattan, almost three times the amount of anywhere else. Um, but certainly, I do hear you on on the on uh, the equitable distribution uh, within the various communities. And, I, and again, I said, um, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm committed to, and we have done that. I, I, you know, part of the challenge I think is, um, you know, the previous programs and existing programs and what we've learned from previous programs and how we rolled it out. And uh, now we have programs that are focused on LMI communities specifically. Um, and we are, um, you know, working uh, again to make sure that those particular programs get in those uh, low to moderate income communities. And I think that was a very deliberate. But, but what happened, Commissioner, as you know, I, I want for you to succeed. I want for you to leave your fingerprint and something new, bring innovation to the city. I know where our heart is, but there's also things that the dynamic in our city sometimes is beyond us because there's already a mechanism that allows certain communities, certain groups to have more access, you know, and to be able to get and apply and take advantage. Like, you know, as, as we've been going through the small business, it's the same thing that we're going through the vaccine. Like, that's why I'm working with the Brooklyn Board President, Eric Adams, to be sure that we resolve the issue of equity. Yeah. Here in Northern Manhattan, we know that the armor is open for the vaccine. 90% of people getting the vaccine, they're white. And I don't want no whites not to get the vaccine, but I have issue when you do look at the line and you don't, you have, you can look and see who is black or Latino. Yes, because most people who know how to navigate the, the system with the internet and the fact that people cannot make the appointment by phone and that's been happening for year and over and over. What we, what we hear is, is that we can, we're working to resolve those issues. But in the, for the meanwhile, people are dying. And those people, they have color and they belong to the working class. So when it comes to this, you know, in my 11 years at the council, you inherit that mess when it comes to what's going on. Why the black and Latino, the working class, the small business, the map and pop, the bodega owner, the multi-service, they apply and they hear and they get so excited when they hear, yeah, you can have access to this loan. But when it comes to who are approved for many reasons, for many red tapes, we are at the same level in Northern Manhattan as we are in the Bronx, Chairman. And I think that this is something that we, we need to resolve it as yesterday. And, and second question is on, on the loan given to the non-for-profit, the strategy impact grant, I'm sorry, not loan, grant. You say 12 given to the Bronx, 
So you could see the name of the institution. The any group, the any group in Northern Manhattan got one of those grants? Um, we, we did not get any applications from Morningside, Washington Heights. Um, we, uh, we did put it out, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the first phase. So it was listed there as uh, the, the, the communities in Manhattan. Again, we were talking low to moderate income communities. So Central Harlem, uh, Chinatown, East Harlem, Hamilton Heights, Inwood, Lower East Side, uh, Morningside Heights, Washington Heights. Um, we intend to fund all those communities. I think we didn't get- Yeah, but you uh, know, and yeah. the thing is that I cannot leave, you know, going to sleep in peace tonight knowing that we intended when some people drink the clean water. So when some people already got the grant, you know what I mean? So for me, yeah. I want to work with you and your team to be sure as soon as you have it, ready to go out, please yeah. send it to us, send it directly to my email, that information so that we can be helpful to also spread that information in our communities. Absolutely, sir. And, and um, it, it will be live on Monday again and we intend to fund it. There's no scenario where it won't be funded. We just did not get an application. We already reached out to folks in out there as well, and we can tell you who we spoke to. Uh, we'll send you that information, the CBOs out there that we talked to um, once we saw that nothing came in. Um, and uh, we will tell you who we talked to and hopefully okay. um, they will- One, one particular yeah. one is the, is the uh, Washington High Chamber of Commerce. Uh, yes. I would like to uh, help with, for them also to get involved with this. And again, more than happy, I believe in you. I'm ready to work with your team. But you know, this is about, even when we go through those numbers, there's other group already getting those. And from the moment you can see borough wise, who's getting one more time, our black and Latino community, for many reasons, they don't know how to navigate. They got the information they didn't apply, you know, or they didn't, whatever, they fail to anything. And we need to be there, go extra mile in order for them to get it. So I appreciate, and, and again, like and what happened there is the same thing that happened in the healthcare, it's happening with the vaccine, it happened with the COVID. And, and, and that's why, again, why I'm working with the Brooklyn Board President Eric Adams also to deal with the real time on whatever information everyone should have access to when it comes to what information, what is available from agencies to our community. So I just want, again, I thank you so much, council member. And again, one point of clarification, the new loan programs that we have are in LMI communities, which I, as I mentioned, 80%, over 80% of all the monies that are going out are going out to minority groups. Um, and so I, I just wanted to make that really, um, you know, really clear that we hear you and we heard every uh, council member um, before uh, when we came to you and this is what you did say, oh, and, and we did create this program, um, which uh, was able to assist uh, Black and uh, Latino and Asian businesses um, across the city, um, you know, to get the support. And we are seeing that over, over 80%. And so um, we certainly want to make sure that the community-based organizations that serve those uh, areas, particularly Washington Heights, Morningside, uh, that we get them, uh, you know, in this um, so that they can also get the grant for that. And so we're absolutely um, uh, looking forward to sending that info out to you so you can work with them so that we can get them this, this funding. They, these communities will be funded. You just need an application. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Council Member Levin who has questions. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Chair and thank you, Commissioner. Uh, um, uh, I want to ask about. I have a, a introduced piece of legislation, 2098, um, which would require Department of Small Businesses to um, uh, to establish a grant program for those businesses that um, that did not qualify for PPP with a with a um, an eye specifically on um, MWBEs. Um, is there uh, has has uh, SBS taken a look at uh, this legislation, and um, and and what is the separately? What is the um, the dollar commitment that this administration is looking at getting out to small businesses 
uh, who are who are not who have not been able to receive um, PPP thus far. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, so uh, certainly would review the bill that was proposed. Um, uh, I'm sure to, uh, I'll talk with the team and, and reviewing that particular legislation, but I do hear the, the, the point on, you know, PPP not get into certain communities. And, and, you know, we are, we're certainly aligned there. You know, as I mentioned, um, in part, we did the LMI storefront um, program um, because we understood the PPP that came to New York City. Uh, once you do the analysis, once the data was recently made available, um, really about 10% went to very, very low income communities. And so, I, I, you know, in part why we wanted to do the LMI storefront program and the LMI strategic grants and so forth that we're doing now, um, it is to address that particular challenge. Um, and then uh, we, uh, we have our fair share campaign uh, to get as much funding to those communities uh, as possible. As I said in my testimony, uh, that campaign is a robust campaign. I mean, we have uh, working with our 40 lenders to make sure that they and our CDFI network um, who are on the ground with our business solution centers as well. We are doing daily webinars and training. We are connecting in you know, businesses in 15 languages to this. I mean, this is an all out uh, push. Um, we, we, we've, you know, we're pushing advertisement out there on a fair share campaign. This is very important. We want to make sure that New York City gets its fair share. And, the, you know, that one well, one can I ask, so that's what we're doing. Can I ask with, with, with reference to PPP, I mean, I've just seen examples in the city of um, uh, institutions um, that receive PPP that, um, you know, are obviously not um, uh, really serving um, lower moderate income families or businesses. I mean, just as, as an example, Poly Prep, I think, got, you know, however uh, many millions of dollars. My staff just told me St. Anne's School got uh, $6 million. Um, you know, nothing against these schools, they're private schools. Um, and maybe they have, um, you know, they, they probably have um, uh, scholarships that they give out. But, um, you know, what we're seeing is, um, you know, a, what we saw, I mean, did, my question is, do, does SBS see the distribution of dollars, of PPP dollars in 2020 as a success or not a success? I wouldn't say that it's, it's been a success. I mean, we have been vocal. Um, I've been vocal uh, about, uh, aggressively so, about the disproportionate impact on the way that the system was constructed. I think the challenge is initially, if you remember, uh, large financial institutions were only dealing with their existing clients and customers. On top of that, uh, they had to have special uh, accounts. I mean, it, it was in how it was rolled out, uh, you know, certainly was a problem initially and what happened when, when, when those who are able and capable to, to, to get to this money fast and quick, they got it, right? And, and a lot of the smaller uh, institution businesses did not. And so we pushed real hard to do several things, one included, uh, making sure that CDFIs had some set aside dollars that they can go to help with the liquidity that they needed to lend to businesses. And so I absolutely agree with you that we, we think that, uh, you know, out of the 18 billion that the city's small businesses received and 160,000 businesses received PPP, um, we certainly didn't think that was uh, enough for the city. That's why we launched the fair share campaign. Okay. Um, well, if you could take a look at uh, 2098, um, yes, which I realize has a fiscal impact for the city, um, but where, where were, um, and I'll just include now, where, where the PPP program is insufficient, somebody has to step in. And, you know, this is where, um, you know, I think that there can be some consensus that, um, uh, that across the city that these are the types of programs that are worthy of city tax dollars, especially if the federal programs are not going to the places where it's really needed. And again, I'm, I, I like St. Anne's School, it's in my district. Um, 
it's I don't think um, you know has as great a need for those dollars as um, small businesses and low and moderate income communities who are um, you know on a nice edge. So with that, thank you very much, Commissioner. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it back over to Chair Jonai, who I believe might have one more question before we turn it over to public testimony. Thank you. Council, thank you. But I want to, um, this hearing has gone too long already. And I know that there's many small businesses that are um, with us today that want to testify and be heard. I'm hopeful that the commissioner um, will stay and listen and hear firsthand what is actually happening. And I know that you have a good sense and a pulse of what is happening, Commissioner. This is no reflection uh, toward you as an individual, but uh, my passion is not for myself. It's for those small businesses that call me literally in tears, crying, uh, asking for help and assistance in their time of need. And the justice that they're receiving is not justice. It's unfair in dollar amounts and in distribution. Um, Commissioner, I know that we have a good working relationship and it's no reflection on you. You don't control the checkbook. Someone else does. And that money's not making into the communities that need it most. So please don't misunderstand my frustration. But it is a sad day for me to be an elected official, a part of this process, and as chair of small business, if I wasn't fighting for every small business, and I mean every small business, in a perfect world, doctors, lawyers, dentists, they all deserve help but not before the poorest of the poor, not before my commercial corridors that are on the outskirts. And I often say this, that yes, Manhattan may be the economic engine, but the fuel of that engine is the outer boroughs. And if we, we're either gonna be one city or we're not, we can't have the tail of two boroughs. So um, if we can have some of the small businesses that have signed up uh, to testify so we can hear firsthand. I want to thank you all for your patience, and um, I'm grateful to you for allowing me to express myself so openly. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Council Member and Commissioner. At this point, we'll now turn to public testimony. Before we do so, I'd like to acknowledge that Council Member Lewis had, has also joined this hearing. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. So please begin, begin once the sergeant has called you and started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should again use the Zoom hand raise function and I will call on you after a panelist has completed his or her testimony. For panelists, once your name has been called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the cue to, to go ahead and begin upon setting the timer. So again, please wait for the Sergeant to announce it and you may begin delivering your testimony. At this time, we will hear testimony first from Susanna Coteen. She'll be followed by Jennifer Tausig, followed by Arthur Nichols. Time starts now. Hi there, good morning and thank you for including me on this call. My name is Susanna Coteen and I have owned Lido in Harlem for 10 years. And I say that Lido employs 40 people. In December, we opened a new Asian restaurant called Bixie on the same block, which employs 15. I serve as the co-president of the Frederick Douglass Boulevard Alliance and I sit on the board of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. Please know that the following are not just my thoughts and opinions, Every day I speak with restaurant owners and we have the same conversations over and over again. While I've loved owning and running my restaurant, my largest hurdle to success has always been by far the New York City government red tape. It is excruciatingly frustrating to be running one's business and have a constant stream of surprise inspections. I would happy, happily be inspected and adhere to healthy, health and safety standards but surprise inspections from multiple departments makes us feel like we are teenagers being caught by teachers at doing something wrong. It is incre incredibly stressful, disruptive, and always incur almost always incurs a fine. To add insult to injury, literally every inspector, including those that come from the same department, will tell us different rules to follow. During COVID and the current 0% indoor occupancy, we have tried to keep Bixie open. 
We were using our outdoor pods for individual parties and we were using the structures we built in the parking lanes, which have very large openings on both sides uh, that can remain open. Two weeks ago, the health department came by and said that we had to stop using all of our outdoor seating immediately. They said that without full, a full wall completely open, they cannot be used for dining. They threatened us with a large fine and, and the revocation of our liquor license. Without any seating for guests in the, in the business, in, without any, sorry, without any seating for guests, the businesses are not economically viable. So we closed them both. My entire team of 55 are out of work. Now I see restaurants all over the city seating people in outdoor structures that do not even come close to um, following these guidelines. This brings me to my second point. The rules are enforced wildly differently from inspector to inspector, as well as from neighborhood to neighborhood. Just this week, I had a, a notice shoved under my door from the DOT that said if we did not put up more reflective tape on our pods within 24 hours, we would incur a $1,000 fine. Surprise inspections, constant punitive fines, and rules that are always shifting under our feet. This does not sound like a city that supports small businesses. What can be done to help small businesses survive in New York? Make the parking lane structures permanent. Allowing restaurants to use the same space, the space for service keeps people employed, is an amenity for our city, provides tax revenue, and is much more useful to New York than allowing one car. Time expired. You finish, Susanna. You oh, thank finish you. I have 30 more seconds. Thank you. I appreciate it. Get rid of the fees for sidewalk cafes. The SLA needs to be streamlined. It took us seven months to get our uh, liquor license approved at Bixie. We had to start paying rent before we knew if we would be, get our liquor license granted. Get rid of the 200 foot, uh, 200 foot rule. Does anyone know why this is still a law? The Department of Buildings is everyone's worst nightmare. I could spend an hour telling you our experience trying to get permits for our new restaurant. Lastly, make one task force and streamline the rules. Truly the number of rules for restaurants needs, that needs to follow to keep customers safe is not infinite. One department could make one or two yearly scheduled appointments with a restaurant for inspection and, and go down a checklist. Again, what good does it do for an inspector to come in and spring upon an operator in the middle of a busy shift? COVID has brought some, something that has already been a real pain point to the forefront. We need to make these changes now. Small, small businesses are failing and leaving the city at an alarming rate, taking jobs, tax revenue, and the culture of individually owned small businesses with them. Thank you for extending my time. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. We'll now hear from Jennifer Tausick, followed by Arthur Nichols. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Jonai. Um, and Commissioner Doris. Uh, my name is Jennifer Tausig and I'm the Executive Director of the Jerome Gunhill Bid in the Bronx and currently serve as co-chair of the New York City Bid Association. The Bid Association represents the 76 individual bids throughout the five boroughs that serve as stewards of our diverse commercial corridors and neighborhood public spaces. Our mission has always been to support the nearly 100,000 local businesses we serve to keep our neighborhoods clean and safe and to bring prosperity to our communities. Never has our work been more essential than it is than it has been during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our members have worked tirelessly through the crisis, educating and delivering resources to our small businesses and workers. This pandemic has created historic health and economic crisis in our city. It is a situation with no easy answers or silver bullet solutions. However, the New York City Bid Association released a call to action last summer for the survival of small businesses in New York City in partnership with a broad coalition of allied stakeholders. The document included a nine point action plan to provide some support for our struggling businesses and their workers. There are some areas where we've made progress, but many where more work is necessary. The full proposal is attached, and I'll, but I'll highlight a few items in a quick progress report. While the mayor has made positive efforts in such areas as, as establishing programs like open restaurants, the rollout of open storefronts was six months too late. He has not appointed an interagency business recovery czar as we requested to coordinate the triage and lead us through the recovery. Direct financial assistance has been in short supply and unequally distributed with the Bronx receiving less than 1% of grants from the city. Outer borough and small businesses, as you'll hear from Yasmin Familia, whose restaurant Caribe is in my bid, are, are unable to take on more debt. 
which is all the financial assistance the city is offering to those in need. There has not been any coordination with the state on significant rent or mortgage relief. The city council now appears poised to, to pass legislation that would add over 4,000 new street vending permits without adequate protections or support for storefront businesses. We have not seen any sales tax holidays. We have not seen any real commitment to reducing boundless red tape for small business owners. In fact, the city council and mayor continue to pass anti-business legislation, such as the Just Cause bill signed a few weeks ago that will surely hurt independently operated franchises. We know financial resources are, are hard to come by these days. So we ask that the council and mayor put our small businesses at the top of their priorities and to carefully consider any additional legislation that would actively hurt businesses and scare away investment from our city just when we need it the most. We are grateful for our partnership with the city and you chair Joni and will continue to support our businesses and work to bring our city's economy and neighborhoods back from this dark time in history. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you for always being such an advocate for small business. What you, your statements are valid and your points are well taken. Um, and I, I agree with you. Uh, this city has proven itself not to be anything but a good partner and value our small businesses. In fact, especially if you're in the outer boroughs, COVID was the knockout punch for many of our small businesses. The city now is kicking them, those small businesses when they're down instead of helping them and giving them a hand up. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for your support. Thank you. We'll now hear testimony from uh, Arthur Nichols, followed by Yin Kong. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Arthur Nichols. I am the owner to Bronx Mass. Um, we're in the Bronx. We're located in the Bronx. Uh, uh, there was a few things that had my concern as far as um, funding and everything, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, things that we've never gotten. I, I didn't know about a few loans. I didn't know about a few grants. Nonetheless, we were in business for about two years, doing excellent. We are doing excellent. Everything went well. Um, COVID hit. Once COVID hit, uh, I had a few contracts uh, from New York State Department of Corrections, the nursing, and the EMS. I have been an EMT for a few years, so I decided to do mass and help everyone. With that, we were out here providing, I had a staff of 10 people. I am now down to a staff of three. Um, my business is doing horrible. You know, it's, it's, we're dead center in the Bronx. I'm trying to help the people around us and we can't even do that. Um, we've been reaching out. Bronx Chambers has been helping me a lot now. Um, you know, as far as grants and everything, there was grants that I wasn't aware of. There was loans that were put out that I wasn't aware of. Like I said, the people in the Bronx really do need a help. We here helping and I can't help if I don't have the help, you understand? Um, we don't mind doing it, but at this point with just three of us, there's been a lot of jobs that I've even turned down because I don't have the manpower to do. So I have to turn down a few of the jobs because I can't hire more staff. Um, again, we went from doing well, we was doing very well to now. If my business make eight grand a month, I'm lucky with that, you know, and um, it, it's shameful. And I'm, I'm just asking for a way to help small businesses. You know, we're, we're still here. We're still doing what we have to do. Um, I'm gonna fight until the end and still provide for the people here. As you know, like I said, my mass there for everyone. I've been helping everyone, but I can't help them if I don't get the help. That's uh. Thank you, Arthur. That's where's your, where's, where, what area is your business located in? I am on Third Avenue on 161st, on 165th. My location was on 165th and um, Simpson, and I had to close it down. So now I'm, I'm based out of my house and doing everything out of my house. Arthur, survive. Survive. We're going to do what we can to help you survive so that you can thrive later. And I hear your pain and it's uh, heartfelt. Um, 
you're not alone. We're all in this together. And uh, we hope that we get our compass back again to make sure that you and so many other small businesses that are part of this city get the help that they need. You are a priority, Arthur. And, uh, the Bronx Chamber is a great resource for you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll next hear testimony from Yin Kong followed by Jennifer Sun, followed by Ayong Kim. Time starts now. Hi, um, thank you so much to the chair and to the committee. I um, really appreciated a lot of the, the questioning that Chair and I um, um, had this morning. Um, I'm here to talk about the exclusion of Chinatown 10013 and the LMI storefront program. Um, as we've already discussed, um, you know, Chinatown is right next to affluent areas and have been excluded from this program. I've invested a lot of my time and a lot of other communities, community members as well to have discussion with SBS. Um, and then finally, as part of a, a sort of task force that was able to speak with um, Commissioner Doris. Um, and through that, I have a few things I would like to share. Um, first of all, um, funding for relief programs such as these interest-free loans really need to be um, dispersed by our local CDFIs. Uh, we really need to empower them to um, have the capital to make the loans. Um, as we, as Commissioner Doris pointed out today, the, the, the most diverse program I think we, we discussed today was actually the ones that was administered by the CDFIs. And I think that's proof that that's the way we should uh, move forward. CDFIs are the institutions that have the language capacity um, and understand the business practices of our communities. Um, two, we really need to discontinue the use of zip codes as an indicator for need or eligibility for future relief programs. Um, census tract data is a finer tune um, um, a mechanism to um, determine which businesses um, uh, have this need. Um, I wanna talk about the discontinuation of the first come first serve approach. Um, we totally understand relief is needed quickly, but in language outreach takes time. Um, immigrant communities need more time to understand what the resources are, um, outreach needs to happen. And if you wanna talk about equal distribution of resources, we need to stop this practice. Um, rounds or phasings uh, would be more appropriate. Um, and also we need to think about seeking incorporation and feedback from the communities that SBS is uh, aims to serve while they're developing and designing these programs. Um, I think the larger picture here is that Chinatown has been excluded before. It's not the first time our community members have had this discussion with SBS, and it's because um, representation needs to be more broad in understanding needs and how to disperse these funds. Um, and, and so I really um, push SBS to build a standard operating procedure so that in the future, we've already talked about these issues. We don't want to lose this headway. Um, I'm expired. Thank you. And I want to thank you for your testimony and for your patience. Um, and I know that Chinatown suffered the most early on as the virus became apparent and the fear of the effects and you never recovered. Uh, you, you back in early February, while the rest of the city was still operating, Chinatown was nearly shut down. So I know the hardships and this has been um, conveyed to the administration and SBS time and time again. We have a lot more to do uh, with the Chinatown the community. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Jennifer Sun, followed by Ayon Kim. Time starts now. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, please hold it. You're still muted. Uh, you may begin again, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Jonai and members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Sun and I'm co-executive director of Asian Americans for Equality or AFI, a community-based organization serving immigrant neighborhoods in Newark City for nearly a half century. My testimony today is informed by AFI's experience spanning 25 years as a small business advocate and lender. 
Through our affiliate, Renaissance Economic Development Corporation, we are dedicated to providing access to capital for communities historically excluded from mainstream small business lending programs. Renaissance is a CDFI and the only CDFI serving the multifaceted Asian American and Pacific Islander communities in New York. As Chair Joe and I just acknowledged, small businesses in Chinatown and other Asian American enclaves began feeling the impact of COVID months before businesses in other parts of the city. In response, AFI and Renaissance established an emergency small business relief loan fund in March. Applications were accessible in English, Chinese, Korean, and Spanish. Raising funds almost exclusively from the private sector, we are able to close more than 150 loans totaling nearly 3 million, helping many immigrant small businesses survive an economic catastrophe. We also provided $1.5 million in PPP loans. We recognize that the scale of this disaster is immense and that the city has too few financial resources at its disposal to rescue small businesses across the five boroughs. That said, we believe there's a lot the Department of Small Business Services could have done to more effectively support our most vulnerable businesses. As Yen just testified, there was great disappointment about the exclusion of the 10013 zip code from SBS's LMI storefront loan program. This decision made it impossible for many businesses in the commercial heart of Chinatown to apply. To Commissioner Doris's credit, SBS has been working to rectify the situation through a community task force increased community outreach, and through discussions about a possible new loan program that could help Chinatown businesses. But these are all potential solutions that only materialized after SBS rolled out its programs for LMI communities in November. In the future, we urge SBS to reach out to grassroots community-based organizations before programs are designed and take their feedback to heart. I also echo Yin's point that um, we not use eligible zip codes, but instead use census tract data to determine where LMI businesses are located. We also urge SBS to continue to partner with a broad range of CDFIs who are serving all of New York's diverse communities of color, rather than relying on a small number of select lenders who lack the language skills and cult cultural competency to deliver loan programs where they are most needed. Finally, and this is a recommendation that should be acted on immediately, Convene a, capital, convene a capital access roundtable, including banks, CDFIs, other community-based organizations of government officials to coordinate small business needs during and after the pandemic. Thank you, and we look forward to your, our continued partnership with you all. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Ayong Kim who will be followed by Yasmin Familia, followed by Ashana Singh. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Jonai and the Committee of the Small Business for this opportunity to testify on this important topic. My name is Ayang Kim. I am the Assistant Director of the um, Small Business Programs at the Asian American Federation. And in, in the face of this dire economic challenges in front of us and our need to recover as soon as possible, I am here to talk about three major needs for our community and the viability of our economy. Mr. Chair, we want to ask that you recognize the need for better metrics for the eligibility of city assistance programs and, to, and the need to mandate community input and make sure that the council has that kind of oversight on SBS and to make sure that the, the need to empower the organizations and the programs that directly cater to the most vulnerable and hard to reach community are actually um, realized. In terms of the metrics to deliver equitable and meaningful small business support, I think I do not have to emphasize more about how the LMI zip codes are not a good representation um, because the encatchment area is too large and arbitrary. This is not only an issue in Chinatown, Manhattan. This is an issue, especially a big issue in outer boroughs, as you yourself know. But more importantly, apart from this issue, we believe that the access, um, that the LMI zip codes don't actually assess the individual businesses needs and the fact that non LMI regions also actually face higher rent and service fees and etc business operation costs in general. So the whole idea that this housing um, standard is being used for an economic recovery is something that very faulty and we need to look back to ourselves on. 
We believe that this LMI standard excludes the commercial corridors with distinct identity and the culture that contributes to the diversity and economic stability of our um, great city. The legacy businesses and the cultural and ethnic centers of the, uh, of the city where people travel to New York City from outer boroughs, outer other states and other countries, Mr. Chair, are the ones that are suffering and are the ones that are being told, honestly, I think you're doing better compared to other regions, so you're not going to prioritize. We want to bring attention to this issue and make sure that the council does practice oversight and make sure that the um, small business um, services actually um, implements a better standard. But with that said, I think that the community input has to be made, um, put into these programs um, with the help of the council as well. The, um, the explanation we are hearing from the administration repeatedly points to the fact that they don't have enough funding and there's not enough money to go around. If that is the case, the feedback that we are giving from the community organization should be better heard and better implemented before these programs are rolled out. The issue about LMI zip code has been pointed out by us, the Federation and our members and the stakeholders in the region multiple Time times. Expired. May I finish just a few more seconds? Yes, please finish Ms. Kim. Thank you. Multiple times on different programs, not just the LMI storefront loans, but the way that the SBS conducts outreach on programs like the CLA program that is very helpful for business owners who need that kind of legal representation, but don't have access and people don't and the outreach itself has to should not be based on a zip code that that is used for postal services. Um, um, so with that, we want to say that the council please look into make sure, making sure that there, there is this kind of oversight on the standard of these eligibility programs and that there is a mandated public feedback and comment period before these programs are rolled out to better ensure outreach and informational access. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kim. I agree with you fully. The Not only the metrics and the standards that are used, but the outreach, there's plenty of room for improvement. It is dismal at best. And I apologize that we were not able to reach out to those nooks and crannies of the communities that needed the help the most. You're not alone in this. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Thank you. We'll now hear from Yasmin Familia, who will be followed by Ashna Singh. Time starts now. Hello, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yasmin Familia, owner of Gun Hill Road Caribbean Restaurant, um, located at 2 East Gun Hill Road, Bronx, New York, 10467. Um, I have been open for this business for 18 years, and I had employees, many um, workers throughout decades that I couldn't afford to keep right now. Um, another big challenge for me is to continue maintain bills, especially rent, still the same. Landlord is unwilling to negotiate. I paid an amount over $16,000 of rent, um, plus real estate tax is almost $30,000 a year. Water is like about $1,200 a month. If you add that up, it's like about $20,000 a month that I'm paying over there just on those three bills. Uh, my sale has decreased 50% and never had, you know, like never had a loan or didn't have any debt before. Now that I have the SBA loan and the PPP, it has helped, but future is uncertain for me and I could not afford any more debt at this point. Um, with the takeout and deliveries are not enough to keep the staff and to pay rent and other bills. Now there is many people unemployed and running out of unemployment benefit. No school and a lot of people closing out store, less people around the area, um, no food trafficking. Every people around the area are very important to our neighborhood. Um, because they bring business around our area too, like he here in El Salon, clothing store, bank teller. They are also customer. We are also customer from each other as a business. Um, many vendor like is crawling around the street outside in front of my store, uh, competing for customers. Not only for me as a restaurant, 
but also for those stores that are around the area, leaving trash, uh, which I get my violations from sanitation. They doesn't have to pay the taxes that I pay and the fine that I have to pay. Um, you know, like I have applied for many um, grants before and never got approved for one. And one that I applied, it was like seven months ago. And just recently this week, I just heard from them. Not a big amount, but a small amount, which is gonna help a little bit, but it's not gonna make me survive. Um, like when you guys, like um, commissioner says, we will do after, what would, when, you, guys, you can finish, Jasmine, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, when you guys will do or want to do something after 11 months of pandemic, after all small business run out of business, at this point, I'm very disappointed and stressed by the situation. Uh, you only see the situation from your side, but the situation that we have to spend, it, like myself, spend like entire days and nights working very hard to raise my family, provide my employees a stable job. And now every effort has done with, with my staff is doing is going down the hall. I cannot afford any more loans. I only can get any like grants if it's gonna help. But right now, like it's it's like I'm falling behind every month and every month because I have debt right now. Yes, but what was what was the grant that you just received notice from? Um, the, the, it, it's from us. Um, it's called a small business relief grant program. I applied that grant since June. What was and, the dollar amount that you received? Uh, $10,000. And they said to send, um, to send, uh, you know, like the statement for my bill, how much I pay, how much I owe for rent. And when I sent that, it was like over $60,000. I just got $10,000. Now I, I'm, I'm in debt like almost 70 something thousand dollars. And landlord haven't even gave me a hundred dollars less out of my payments. I'm not using the whole entire corner, which is a very expensive corner and just take out and deliver it. I'm, I'm not gonna be able to make it or survive. I trying and I'm trying every effort that I can but it's it's not enough. How, and, I'm, and I just want to get an overall idea of what's happening to your particular business and how important it is for the services and the product that you offer to this community. You're on Gun Hill Road, very busy. Yes. A lot of uh, tenement buildings that rely on your restaurant if they can even afford to eat out, and it's mostly pick up and deliver. How much are you losing yeah. each and every month? Your well, deficit. you could say that uh, percentage is 50,000, 50% out of my sales. So what does that dollar amount come out to every month? You're in the hole. The hole is getting deeper and bigger. How much is that every month on average? Mm, we're going to say like about $20,000. A month in the red. You're losing every month that you stay open. Yes. You're losing twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, or more. You can say because sometimes when it's snow, when it's rain, sometimes you cannot do same deliveries. So you know, like people we, we won't be able, or the driver won't be able to deliver. So your sales goes all the way down. People don't want to go outside. Like since you, if you're already home, you're not working, and your kids are home. What you're gonna do? You're gonna do cooking. Nobody's gonna order deliveries. You understand? So like I have done the outdoor dining area for when they allow me to do that, they came over, measure everything, send everything. And like, like Susan was saying, they came over and say, I needed some reflective tape. Okay, I need that. I would do that. But they just gave me 24 hours. They came yesterday and they want that to be done today in 24 hours. And if it's not, I'm gonna get fined. So they are pressuring you when you have this pressure with, your payments with the bills, with the keeping employees. Because sometimes they don't want to stay working with you because you're not giving them enough hours. But you cannot give any more hours because you can have them working for you over time. 
Yes, but how many years are you in business? 18 years in that the same right corner. So I have provided many, many, many people with employees at that location. Before the COVID, before February, you were thriving. You were doing okay. You were providing yes. for yourself. Yes. Can you survive another five months? I don't think so. I told you, I'm, I'm already deep in $70,000, all the lender, plus I owe the SBA now, the loan that they already gave me, I already spent it. So how, how do you think? How about you, your real estate taxes? My, did you, did you real pay estate, your real estate? Yes, it's like almost $30,000 a year. Did, did you pay that in January? Uh, no, I, I was paying like $1,000 or $2,000 a month. And sometimes I couldn't even send anything. Like right now I'm behind on real estate taxes from last year, almost what? Sixteen or twenty thousand dollars, and now in January, I believe I'm supposed to get the real estate again, and that's something that that I feel like uh, I'm not going to be able to make it. I'm not going to, and if I, it was me, a business for eighteen years that was being stable in the area, imagine those businesses that just started or probably are were not as stable in the area. I don't know how they're doing it, but I think they're already closing the door. Because to tell you the truth, I was, I've been there 18 years. So I have offered my employees a stable jobs whenever, every time they come to work, because I worry about, I work days and nights for 18 years to make sure that I have my family depend from that. My daughter and my son works with me. So, and many people too around the area. Yasmin. I hear your pain and you are exactly the business that was supposed to be helping a woman owned business, a minority owned business. And I'm proud. I promise you. And if you heard it today, my passion, I am fighting for you. I am going to continue to fight for you to make sure that you can survive this. Survive. Yeah, survive. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ashna Singh, who will be followed by Jan Lee, followed by Kathleen Sforza. Hi, Ashna. Thank you. My name is Ashna Singh. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm speaking on behalf of Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A, in short, Brooklyn A. Thank you for giving our office the opportunity to provide testimony today. BKA, Brooklyn A, was founded in 1968 with a focus on providing services in low-income neighborhoods where our clients live, developing programs and staff that are part of and responsive to those communities, collaboration with the city, state, and federal officials to enforce laws that uphold the rights of our communities and develop legislative solutions is also an integral part of our strategy. In 2017, Brooklyn A recognized the common and significant hurdles facing commercial tenants to address leasing issues that are foundational to their business, including that there are minimal rights for commercial tenants on a state level, making leases the only form of protection for small business owners. We joined with the United for Small Business New York City Coalition, which is a coalition fighting to protect small businesses from the threat of displacement, to advocate for public funding to adopt a citywide approach to provide support for small business owners through attorneys who could help them understand and exercise their rights and options during their lease. The City Council and Small Business Services also exhibited leadership and vision in creating the non-residential tenant harassment law, the commercial lease assistance program, and securing funding to implement these initiatives. Brooklyn A has had the honor to serve as the lead organization to implement the program in close collaboration with Volunteers of Legal Service and Take Roots Justice and partnership with many community-based organizations throughout the city. Since its inception, the CLA program has addressed over 1,200 legal matters the demographics of whom consist of business owners from all five boroughs in every city council district and who are 99% lower income, 75% individuals of color, 64% immigrants, 51% women, 33% non-native non English speakers, 20% sole proprietors, and the majority with five or fewer employees. Legal representation in lease matters levels the playing field. Even before the pandemic, nearly 50% of new businesses did not make it the past five years. Through our assistance, we found that the represented businesses were more likely to stay open and see lower rent increases. This program is the city is the only city funded source of free legal assistance for small business owners. 
Recently, a fitness business owner came to our program facing hundreds of thousands of dollars in rental arrears from the time of the New York State pause and lockdown of all non-essential businesses. And due to reduced business revenue was unable to afford rent even following reopening. Fortunately, the landlord wanted to keep our client as a tenant and was willing to work with our client to forgive some arrears and possibly reduce the rent. However, the lease with our client um, the lease amendment provided by the landlord contains several provisions that could have exposed our client to serious financial risks, including a provision that could have allowed the landlord to terminate the lease at any time with very little notice without returning a security deposit. We are currently helping the client negotiate fairer terms. After our last call with the client discussing issues with the lease amendment, the client thanked us for alerting them to these provisions and said that without legal representation, he would have likely signed whatever agreement the landlord sent. Many small business owners, like our client, do not have access to readily available legal advice or attorneys to advise them, leaving them in a vulnerable position to sign potentially unjust commercial leases. An Asian restaurant owner reached out to CLA because they were unable to pay their rent due to the pandemic. We were able to negotiate 50% rent abatement agreement through the end of the year. The client agreed to leave the space and saved over $25,000 through the rent abatements. Our client also received their security deposit upon vacation. Having legal representation when communicating with landlord or property management companies provides small business owners who may otherwise experience intimidation or lack of clarity in asking for what is just and fair. In addition to the devastating losses of their businesses, many business owners endure large amounts of debt from the back payments expected and enforced by their landlords, despite the inability to operate in a pandemic. While the impact of COVID-19 is unprecedented territory for small business owners and most of our communities at large, the small business community has always been vulnerable. Time expired. Yeah, much longer missing. Two more paragraphs, maybe 30 seconds. Go ahead, finish it. Thank you. In 2020, we saw our city's most marginalized communities suffer as the Amazons of the world have broken records in profit and revenue. Our city's small businesses not only need consumer support, but legal government and structural support to compete with larger businesses that have access to a plethora of resources. Last year, the CLA program and the business it represents was put in a hard position. The approved FY21 city council budget cut funding for the commercial lease assistance program due to the reality that was New York City's government facing its worst budget crisis since the 1970s. After advocacy by many elected officials, city agencies, small business owners, and community-based organizations, Mayor de Blasio restored public support for legal representation on behalf of small business owners fighting to keep their businesses alive. We thank the administration for this decision, the reversal of this decision to cut funding for the program at this pivotal moment of crisis, despite budgetary constraints, is a testament to the critical need for services for some New York City's small businesses, as well as the program's successful track record. Our small businesses not only support the local economy, but our local communities as well. They define the neighborhoods we all live in and love. Legal support for our small business owners keeps their businesses open, saves them from debt, and creates opportunities for intergenerational wealth for their families and for our communities. It is critical that the city continue to support the commercial lease assistance program that provides essential services to save small businesses, which will be crucial for the recovery of New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jan Lee, who will be followed by Kathleen Sforza. I'm starts now. Is Miss Lee still here? Please, uh, please hold on for a second. We're just trying to uh, get you unmuted. Can you please, uh, Ms. Lee, uh, click unmute on your end? Are you able to do so? Okay, we'll, we'll move on to the next panelist for now while uh, Jen Lee works, but we try to figure out the issues with Jen Lee. So, um, I believe we were going to hear from Kathleen Sforza. Uh, are you? And yes, you are available. Um, so, Ms. Sforza, you may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Thank you. 
Time starts now. Okay. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, I was the owner of a small business for 25 years. I closed in 2013, but this pandemic has made me feel for all the small businesses out there. When it comes to how New York City treats its small businesses, NYC will soon be an African for nanny city. Why? Overregulation and taxes on small businesses do not encourage entrepreneurship. They discourage it. Government bureaucracy scares people. Government bureaucracy hits the stop button every step of the way. Business owners do not know the rules of the game. Why? Overregulation by government, government agencies cause rule change. Business owners can never truly know if they are doing the right thing. As I said before, I own Town & Country on Staten Island for 25 years from 1987 to 2013. I was a business owner who feared every time I got a visit from one of the government agency. The first thing I thought was, what did I do wrong? It would take a massive amount of education to keep up with the rules and regulations of every city, state, and federal agency. I have family and friends who work in the restaurant business. A visit from the Department of Health can end up with an unfair grade. Sanitation is quick to ticket a store owner for improperly disposing of garbage or not sweeping 18 inches from the curb. This pandemic has shown the small business community just what the government thinks of them, disposable. Big box stores were all open, but small businesses that can control their crowds needed to be closed. Where is the logic in all that? I don't understand. Unfortunately, years of government regulations cause innovative entrepreneurs to throw their hands up in the air and give up. Let's change from the government, go, let's change from government the great discourager to government the great encourager. Post-pandemic recovery will need to involve individual cash vet grants without all the red tape to assist small businesses with back rent and utility bills. No fining, it's not needed. We need to open this city and build it back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, thank you for being a voice for those small businesses that are afraid to speak up because they're afraid of retaliation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee, are you available? Are you able to speak? Okay, um, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lee, you will begin. You will be followed by Camilla Hanks. So please begin when you get the cue. Uh, I so appreciate the time given to us to speak, uh, Chair Jonai, and to the commissioner. Uh, my name is Jan Lee. I'm a third generation resident and property owner here on Mock Street, historic Mock Street in Chinatown. You know, Mock Street is so well known. Uh, my family's been here going on 96 years and uh, Rogers and Hart immortalized Mott Street in a song, and I'm going to spare out of respect to the council singing the uh, the verses from that, but we all know what they say. They talk about the, 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 push, the push carts in Chinatown. They talk about what street compares to Mott Street. And so for a hundred years, people have been humming that, sh that song as they walk down my street. And the pride that we feel as property owners and as people who are supportive of small businesses, I have three of them in my building. We feel, on the one hand, that we are supported at times um, by the city of New York. You know, we saw during the pandemic a parade of, of politicians walking down our streets. The mayor ate noodles here. He had ice cream here. Surely, with that kind of exposure, we would understand that we would get recognition from the city of New York. But actually, the opposite has happened. When you use zip codes, you bisect Chinatown, and we are. Uh, lumped in on 10013 with Tribeca, which has a median income of $879,000. We cannot be lumped in using zip codes, as my colleague Yin Kong, who's, who I've been working with, <coughs> has said. Instead, we really should be looking at census tracts. If you did look at census tracts, you'd understand that uh, over a third of the people who are over the age of 65 in my neighborhood are living under the poverty line. They rely on small businesses in their community for sustenance. 
And so we have to be careful when we start to look at our communities and community, and I'm not the only community that was bisected who lost out on the zero interest loan program. We have to start looking at local grassroots groups to help before the rollout. And I do want to say that we did have a meeting with, with the commissioner, but it was five weeks after the rollout. My community reached out to our council member who was helpful. We reached out to the local business improvement district and we reached out to small business services. But five weeks to have a meeting on New Year's Eve was late. And in that five weeks, that $35 million, that pot of money was diminishing. And there's only so many times when I could interview uh, businesses only to have them burst out into tears, crying in front of me. This is taking an emotional toll on us. We are starting to become very disenfranchised with this government. And I'm so happy that the chair has alluded to the damage psychologically that this does to communities of color. How are we to trust our government if we raise the flag, we tell you when things are going wrong, we tell you that we've been left out, we have a mixed message of the mayor and politicians walking on historic Mott Street and then say, we forgot you, we'll try to do better, we'll try to do better next time. How do we repair this disenfranchisement that we are feeling now, the mixed messages that we're getting from our government? We have to do better. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you. We'll now hear from Camilla Hanks. Hanks will be followed by Don Christian Jones, followed by Jacqueline Paparante. Time starts now. Hi, good, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you so much, members of the committee and the fellow citizens on the call today. This is probably one of the most important city council hearings of, of the year, of, of our lifetime, to be honest with you. I have been working in Staten Island as the, I'm the president of a economic development corporation, Historic Tappan Park, and I'm also the founder of the Minority Women in Business Association here. The information that we got today was staggering and completely unacceptable. Um, I've been working on the ground for 20 years. I've been assisting small businesses with the application process for the PPP loans. And I have found that many businesses are just not familiar with the process and need assistance to ensure that they receive the desperately needed funds in which they are entitled. In addition to the financial resources and small businesses, it is critical for the city of New York through the Small Business Administration, increase its effort to educate small businesses on the loan process. In the onset of COVID-19, I personally went door to door to talk about the SBS uh, relief packages. Many of these businesses now simply don't exist. When I hear 3% of, of, of the funding was allocated to my borough, I think of the numerous vacancies, the closures, the shuttered businesses and savings, dreams, they're gone. We're not applications, we're not zip codes. We need to be looking at who is opening businesses, who has businesses and SBS and the city of New York took the pathway of least resistance. They didn't do the work on the ground to engage the people who are doing the work, the community-based organizations, the SIADC, the Chamber of Commerce, the uh, Historic Tappan Park, the Minority Women in Business Association. We intimately know, just as the people on this call intimately know our neighborhoods, you know, small businesses are not an application. They are real people. And we did, and nothing was done to make sure that the funds have landed in, the, in those who needed it most. I wanna leave this by saying, for every dollar the city of New York helps a small business, that's a job they save. You're doing the governor of New Jersey a huge, huge favor because they're leaving in the droves. And after a while, you're not gonna have anything left to tax. You're not gonna have anyone left to tax. So my question to SBS going forward and the city of New York, is that at what point when all the applications came in, did you realize that the Bronx and Staten Island got less than 5%? What was that trigger? 
how do we look at as the process is going is that, hey, I haven't heard from Camila Hanks or Jacqueline Tacarante or Cesar Claro okay. or Linda Barron on what was what was um, being allocated to our district that sorely needs it. So I really thank you. For, and especially um, Chair Joan, I you it was the best hour and a half spent listening to you because you hit the nail on the head. And I hope that this is not the last conversation, but that this is the beginning of a conversation to start saving our small businesses and stop saying New York is closed for business. Thank you. Thanks, thank you so much for being a part of this, for speaking uh, up for those that are trying to survive. Uh, and I do hope and agree with you that this should be the start of something and not the end of something. And I'm sure that you are just as disappointed as the total dollar amount that was allocated uh, through those six programs. It equates to a total of $356 per business. That's not financial aid. That doesn't even meet the, uh, the uh, utility expenses for our small businesses on a monthly basis let alone all of the other overhead and expenses that they have. And, and this is, thank you. And this issue isn't new. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've get, I get funding from small from the Department of Small Business Services. This is not new. It's just exasperated with COVID-19. We have to do everything we can. It's, it's, it, this is tragic. It's staggering and tragic. I have reiterated your points time and time again. Every dollar that we put into small business is a dollar that's going to give us a return. It's going to give us a return on our investment. It's going to continue to uh, fill the taxpayer corpus so that we can provide those essential services that are needed to all of New York City. When we lose these businesses, we will lose the ability to fill our tax corpor corpus to provide those services. It's a downward spiral. God bless you and thank you, Ms. Hicks. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Don Christian Jones, who will be followed by Jacqueline Takarante. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. Thank you um, for all the testimonies and for this hearing. Um, I'm here representing public assistance, uh, just to give a brief rundown of who we are. Uh, we are a mutual aid network production design and resistance hub founded on June 6 as an organizing base in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and global uprisings. Public assistance has led and partnered a number of community initiatives since its inception. Um, we are currently facing eviction as of Monday. On June 20th, the current property owners uh, at our space at 711 Franklin notified us that we have 30 days to vacate the premises, forcing us to move and immediately find a new HQ um, amidst pandemic. This is alarming, but not unforeseen. The terms of our occupancy here have been at risk of sudden termination due to the systemic prioritization of profit over community. Safe havens for queer, black, and brown young people who make up our community are both rare and fast disappearing, making our continued existence crucial. Um, we do not wish to further escalate this conflict situation and relationship that have been fraught with uncertainty from start. Uh, we, have an in, we, have, we are intent on transitioning from our current space safely, uh, securely, and with dignity. Uh, while this is not an easy decision to make, it is one we are coming to grips with. Our roots in Crown Heights transcend the walls of 7-Eleven Franklin. We seek a stable, hospitable environment in which to flourish for years to come. Um, that is the gist of my testimony, and I thank you all for listening. Mr. Jones, there is a eviction moratorium in place. You cannot be evicted. I want you to take down my phone number, and I will follow up with you. 718-931-1721. Thank you so much. I've been hearing much about this moratorium, and I'm just trying to find out if... It, we must apply for it or the ways in which we can be made eligible. You're protected automatically. No one can be evicted. No uh, business or residential tenant can be evicted under this moratorium. You are protected. And I'll go through those details with you. Thank right. you so much. You can sleep well tonight that you're not going to be evicted at the end of the night. Thank you. You're muted, Steve. All right. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jacqueline Takarante, followed by 
MJ Okuma. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of City Council. My name is Jacqueline Tecarante, and I'm a small business owner living in the greenest borough here on Staten Island. I own and manage the largest marketing and public relations agency, JMT Media. I'm the first official Native American MWBE in New York City history. And I serve, proudly serve as the second vice president of the Minority Women in Business Association of Staten Island, the first of its kind led by my colleague, Ms. Camilla Hanks. It's good to be here. Thank you to all the delegation working on behalf of all the small businesses communities here on Staten Island. In my role, I'm here to talk about small businesses and their stories that are coming to me struggling and unable to take the time off to speak. So I'm sharing today's virtual platform. From B Yoga Studio on the North Shore, owner Larissa has been physically closed for 309 days. Directly from her, she says, the administration has not addressed the indoor fitness industry since the last week of August. Under New York City reopening guidelines for gyms, we were not included. We have not heard a word about what is next or even a possible reopening. It is frustrating to not even be considered worthy of part of the community. New York City is the only city where indoor fitness classes are not allowed. Enough is enough. This is an industry that makes people healthy physically, mentally, and emotionally. From Joe at Joyce's Tavern, he states, please open up small businesses that are closed due to regulations. Even if we had open indoor dining at 50% or even 25% capacity, that could help. We need support from city council for accessibility to city funding, adequate and reliable accessibility for services and outreach, which we discussed earlier today from qualified representatives that understand the needs as a small business. Small businesses locally in New York City need your help with minority businesses closing brick and mortar commercial spaces at a staggering 30% rate, especially on the North Shore of Staten Island. We're calling on you to advocate for additional funding for small business support. From the annual Making the Grade report provided by the New York Comptroller's Office between March and August of 2020, the city spent more than 1.5 billion for COVID related goods and services contracts yet only 11% million went to MWBEs. And as you disclosed, Chairman, less than 3% went to Staten Island MWBEs. And even at that, I would like to see some data to support that. Straight from the report, three entities have spent $0 in procurement for MWBEs, including health and hospitals that need it, especially here on Staten Island, the Office of the Mayor, and the Department of Parks and Recreation. From the greenest borough in New York City, Staten Island has yet to see the number to reflect uh, in the numbers. After reaching out to local small businesses, everyone's goals are very, very simple, and I'll make it quick. Provide adequate, adequate and reliable resources, provide um, accessibility. I just have one sentence left and I'm done. Please, please Jacqueline. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, provide accessibility to city funding, open up New York City. I wanna thank the council for the work during unprecedented times and for showing up. And we look forward to working with this council to help push through initiatives to help small businesses to support and flourish this beautiful city. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you very eloquently put and thank you for fighting for those small businesses that are trying to survive right now. And you are a great voice for them. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. We'll now hear from MJ Okuma, who will be followed by Letitia Romaro, who was our last uh, registered speaker. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Jonaya. My name is MJ Okuma with the Human Services Council, a membership organization representing 170 human services providers in New York City. Uh, the mayor's recovery agenda included the core priorities of creating high quality jobs and continuing to make New York the fairest city in America. Both have fallen short due in part to his administration's refusal to work with local human services organizations on the front lines. Before the mayor's agenda was announced in September 2020, leaders from across the human services sector were brought together in June as part of the mayor's nonprofit and social services recovery task force. Members of that task force came up with a list of core recommendations to support essential workers in the sector, protect community services, and amend the procurement process to allow needed flexibility to meet community needs none of their recommendations were implemented. At the same time, the expertise of community organizations out in the front lines were being ignored. The city cut human services contracts even more and retroactively called clawed back indirect funding. 
cuts to cuts in fiscal year 20 were retroactive and not announced until after the fiscal year was over. And the city still has not provided any information about how fiscal year 21 contracts will be impacted by cuts to indirect. This means human services nonprofits are currently operating in the second wave of COVID with no clear communication from the city about how much they are gonna be paid for their services. The nonprofit human services sector employs 200,000 workers in New York City, the majority being women of color, and has seen a net loss of 44,000 jobs since February, with no job rebound in sight. The massive net loss of jobs is devastated not only to those impacted workers, but also to New York City as a whole. Our city's failure to have a strong and fully funded human services sector undermines the scope and effectiveness of essential services in a time of desperately growing need and sets our city's recovery back. Cuts to human services during the pandemic and the refusal to listen to the nonprofit social services recovery task force has deeply harmed the communities in crisis that the Blasio administration claims to support. These actions obstructed our city's recovery in communities already impacted the most by COVID-19 due to structural racism, ableism, and income inequality, with Black and Brown New Yorkers suffering the deepest harm. In order to support the recovery in the communities that need it the most, uh, and, to, and to support the essential role that community nonprofits play in our economy, the funding for jobs and services in the human services sector provides must be restored and bolstered. Without immediate action, it will only be more difficult for our city to recover and rebuild. Thank you, Chair Doronai, for holding this hearing and giving me the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. We'll now hear from Letitia Romaro, who again is our last registered panelist. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairman Jonai, for getting us. Uh, and you truly do. And thank you, Commissioner Doris, for really trying to help us because I know you are. But you have to understand that by dividing us up by zip codes, um, you, you've just, you, you've missed the mark here and it's hurt us. You know, Small business owners uh, take home an average of $60,000 in salary a year. That's less than most civil servants actually take home. And, and you all have been able to keep your paychecks, but we generate 50% of the employment in the city, about a billion dollars in payroll. So when you don't look at us as a whole, when you don't help us, the small business owners, the mom and pop shops, then what you do is you allow for the corporations, the big corporations who could sustain these closures and this up and down um, with what we're allowed to do. Uh, you're helping them and you're hurting us. Small businesses operate on about a 20% profit margin. So when you cut our ability to deliver services to 25%, you put us into bankruptcy. And for most of us, we've we've mortgaged our homes to live our dream, to employ other people and to deliver services. So if you put us out of business, not only do you lose our employees, but you, you lose our business taxes. And then you also, we, we become homeless. So where do we go? We go to whatever state is going to be business friendly to us because truly small business owners, if they're not allowed to supply their business, what incentive do we have to stay? And so I ask you, if you take anything away from this hearing, think of this, Staten Island, five programs that you have offered and three of them we have not received any, any benefits from. That's not right, that's wrong. And that's because of how you've based you know, the, your, the information on zip codes, you have to do better. It is unfair to punish one zip code against another, as we've seen with Chinatown. Look at us as a global entity, the entity that is the engine of New York City. Keep us here. Let us be the rock and the foundation so that we employ others. Remember, we are the ones that care about our, our customers. We know how to take care of our customers. We know how to keep them safe. Because if we didn't, then we wouldn't be in business at, at all. So out of $89 billion budget, $4.4 million for small business? No, no, that's so wrong. Remember, we also, because of our leases, triple net leases, we are responsible for property taxes. 
And, and so I, I just wanna leave you with this is please just think of us as a whole. We have building owners, we have cab drivers, we have entertainers, we have restaurants. You can make the difference in our economic recovery in the future if you help us stay here. We can't hang on without you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that Staten Island uh, came out in such strong numbers to participate in today's hearing so that we can understand the unfair disparity between counties and boroughs and zip codes. Thank you for sharing your story. Survive. We're going to try to figure this out, and I'll continue to be that advocate for you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Yep. Just going uh, to just like to say if we have um, inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has not yet been called, please use the Zoom hand raise function, and I'll call on you in order. Seeing none, I will now turn it back over to Chairman Jonai to adjourn the hearing and offer any closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I, I want to thank all of you for being a part of today's hearing. Your testimony has been heard. It will be reflected on it. And I promise you that we're going to do what we can to rectify any of the wrongs. And I'll continue to be that advocate for you and to all of the small businesses in New York City, the 240,000 small businesses survive. We will thrive together when we come out of this pandemic and crisis. God bless you. Thank you.